ahead and get started. We have a lot of ground to cover today. I'm Mark Lundstrom. I'm a professor at Purdue and a member of the organizing committee. And I want to welcome you to what promises to be a very interesting and lively discussion on a really important topic. So as we all know, the US is making plans to reshore and re-energize its microelectronics industry. Uh, universities will play an important role in many different ways in this effort. And, but perhaps the most important role will be to develop a new generation of microelectronics engineers and technicians. And that'll be absolutely critical to the success of this effort. So as we in universities begin to make plans to address this challenge, we organize this workshop to hear from our colleagues in the industry and government, their perspectives on the needs, the opportunities, the challenges, the programs that will be available to support these efforts. We have an outstanding group of panelists and moderators, and I really want to thank them for making time in their busy calendars for this, uh, to participate in this discussion. So to kick things off, I want to introduce Meng Chang, the John A. Edwardson Dean of Engineering and Executive Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at Purdue, to say a few words from his perspective as a Dean of Engineering and as someone who recently spent a year in Washington as these discussions were getting underway. Meng? Thank you very much, Mark. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Great. Uh, great to see all of you, and thank you, Mark, for you and your team's leadership working with our partners to create the first of the series of workshops on a very important and timely topic. And uh, I know that there are friends from academia, industry, and government with us today. Thank you for joining us. As Mark mentioned, my name is Meng Cheng. I'm uh, an EVP and the Dean of College of Engineering at Purdue University, and in year 2020, I spent a year of sabbatical serving the country in the State Department and participated in that reshoring and re-energizing the semiconductor microelectronic manufacturing industry in the United States. We all know that uh, chips is the hardest commodity to get these days. It is critical to our national security, job security, and economic security. We also know that uh, tens of billions of federal resources in this country and likely hundreds of billions of investment from private sector will be pouring into the semiconductors industry this decade. And we know that one of the most important supply chains is that of human talent and workforce development. How do we find tens of thousands of new semiconductor industry engineers throughout the whole supply chain in order to make the best use of those hundreds of billions of dollars of investment. And that brings us to today's day long workshop. Like many of our friends in academia across the country, we are moving quickly to help address this challenge on workforce and human talent pipeline. For example, we announced two months ago that uh, Purdue Engineering is launching a new set of degrees and credentials that are interdisciplinary across electrical, computer, chemical, material, and mechanical engineering to cover the entire food chain from tools, materials, to design, to manufacturing, to packaging in dedicated new set of master degrees, undergraduate minors, and graduate certificates, both in residence and through online learning. And along with Department of Defense, partnership with a dozen universities, uh, Purdue is leading the SCALE program, S-C-A-L-E, to develop a trained and clearable workforce in trusted assured microelectronics. Along with our colleagues in industry, we look forward to the discussion today for insights and guidance as we launch these programs and they must involve partnership across federal, state, government, industry partners, and academia partners. We've got a great set of uh, exceptionally qualified panelists and moderators for today's discussion, uh, and I want to thank all of them for taking the time. Panel one will be looking at where the microelectronic industry is headed in order to identify the most crucial opportunities and skills needed for the workforce. 
Panel two will focus on commercial workforce development, and panel three on workforce for defense electronics. Now, before we start with panel one, I would like to introduce Mr. David Roberts, my great colleague and friend, and a fellow Hoosier here, who is the Chief Innovation Officer at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, IEDC, to say a few words about how states such as Indiana see the coming opportunities in semiconductors. Over to you, Dave. Oh, thank you, Dean Chang. That's um, very kind of you uh, to say. Thank you for inviting me to participate. And thank you for your visionary leadership at Purdue, for your service to our country at the State Department during a tumultuous 2020. But uh, I think as you already knew and, and maybe learned there and even greater capacity chips are one of the critical infrastructure needs of our time. Along with reliable electrical grid and high-speed, low-latency communication architecture, and um, I'm happy to report that here in Indiana, I'm I'm honored to serve the state as a chief innovation officer, and and in other places that that might imply that I have some answers. But I think you'll find if you don't already know that Hoosiers believe that we reach the best answers together, uh, and that the government should listen at least twice as much as we speak. So. Um, what I will say though at the opening here is that as we've listened to you, to your colleagues at Purdue, experts at, at our other institutions such as Notre Dame, Rose Holman, IU, you know, Ivy Tech on technician and operating and the operator side of, uh, of the consideration, our friends at Crane, uh, some, some great industry experts and friends like Ian Steff and, and Ron Goldblatt, Mark Lewis, George Scalise, the, the, the names continue on and on of the folks that we've um, tried to work with and, and learn from. And what we've done is more deeply understood the crit criticality of chips uh, to the end users that are key to our own state's economy. And just as an example, you know, we have the second highest gross state product related to mobility uh, behind only Michigan and the chip supply chain challenge, supply chain challenges have taken um, us to a point where OEM facilities throughout our state have suffered and had temporary production pauses and, and temporary layoffs of their workers. And the same is true for the RV industry and, and to some degree, the medical device sector. This is of grave importance to us, um, but we're thrilled to see activity like research at Purdue and Notre Dame being supported by SRC and DARPA. Um, and in all of that, we understand federal and state government leadership is important. That's why Governor uh, Holcomb penned an op-ed recently in the Hill supporting CHIPS Act funding and why our governor is planning to form a group that will advise his office on the specific needs of workforce in the semiconductor industry. So look for more information on that in the, in the very near future. You know, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't also say that we are honored to welcome companies like Skywater and Enhanced Semi who just this week announced new activity here in Indiana and are growing a, a cluster of semiconductor companies that are designing, making, and testing chips that our end users need. We're also encouraged by the support, I mentioned the name earlier, of an industry veteran and Purdue alum, George Scalise, to est help establish an entity called the Semiconductor Innovation Center, which will guide our state strategy into the future. And so with that, I wanna thank you. Thank you again. Uh, thanks for everyone coming today and actively engaging in this, in this semiconductor industry's growth here in the state. Uh, I wanna thank you also for the work that, that you're doing to serve the national interest of the United States. And so with that, uh, I wish you a great day and I'll send it back to Mark Lundstrom. Okay. Thank you, Dave, and, and thank you, Mung. So we're ready to get panel one started. And to do that, I'd like to introduce panel one moderator, Dr. Bill Chappell. Uh, Bill is CTO of Microsoft Azure Global, also Vice President, uh, I'm sure, CTO of Azure Global and Vice President of Mission Systems at Microsoft. Uh, prior to that, uh, Bill was the Director of the Microsystems Technology Office at DARPA. And prior to that, I'm proud to say he was my faculty colleague here at Purdue. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill and we will get panel one started. Appreciate that, Mark. Um, yeah, I miss my days at Purdue being your colleague. That was uh, uh, definitely a highlight of, of my career. Uh, and since then, you know, I've been focused on uh, areas such as this. And 
Uh, it's a, definitely a passion project of mine, and it's a great honor to be able to host and bring together a really good uh, set of perspectives across our uh, industry. I want to introduce my panelists first, and then we're going to have them uh, dive in and give their perspectives on where we sit in this specific uh, moment in time. Our panel uh, is uh, meant to set the table for today where we try to look out of where we sit today and where we're heading uh, as an, an industry. And to do that, we were very lucky to be able to get the right perspectives. Uh, Deidre Hanford is from uh, Synopsys as the chief security officer. So as we are um, <clears throat> looking at semiconductors, we have real strength in this country in design and in EDA. Uh, but as we look where we you know, have challenges, we also wanna look at where we have uh, strengths and how do we maintain those strengths or pivot off of those strengths. So she will be representing uh, the EDA market and the design uh, community. Chandra Mooley, uh, Senior Fellow and Manager uh, R&D Devices at Micron Technologies. So uh, Micron has been the strength of our memory uh, in this country for, uh, for the last, you know, as far as I've been paying attention, we'll put it that way. So it's a, a very strong pillar in which we have uh, had as an anchor um, within this uh, country. Mark Papermaster joins us as the Chief Technology Officer and Executive Vice President, Technology and Engineering for AMD. And the rise of AMD in the last couple of years has been a real strength uh, as well as uh, they have grown uh, with leaps and bounds. So that represents sort of the large chip uh, design and uh, the manufacturer of uh, you know, very large scale uh, chips that are uh, competing at the highest levels. Sri uh, Ramaswamy is the senior policy advisor representing the government. She's a senior policy advisor uh, at the Office of Policy and Strategic Planning for the US Department of Commerce. So as we sit in this very special moment, you know, the government's gonna have a very strong influenced on, on where we head, commerce is going to take a lead in that and Sri represents and is really where uh, a lot of the discussions are, is the epicenter of a lot of those discussions uh, at commerce. So we're glad to be able to have uh, Sri. And last but not least, Thomas uh, Sonderman, the president and CEO of Skywater Technology. And so we have uh, real strength also in this country in smaller, flexible fabs, uh, that can do some really interesting and exotic uh, uh, capabilities. And so how do we make sure we're you know, looking at advanced CMOS and how do we you know, take care of the, that uh, race, which is a, a, a real difficult race to run while you also look at the uh, flexibility and um, viability of some of the um, other manufacturers in this country. And so Thomas is gonna be able to represent that point of view. So we have this really great panel that I think um, represents all of the breadth of the electronics industry. Myself, I will be the uh, host and um, leading the uh, discussion. Uh, as Mark said, I was at Purdue, I was in academia, went into the government, focused on these things. I'm now in a corporate environment. And so I get to see things from different uh, perspectives. And this area has always been a passion of mine. We started uh, ERI, the Electronics Resurgence Initiative, specifically trying uh, to address the research challenges, uh, both funding universities to fund that next generation of students, but more importantly, really looking at this time, not as a uh, fallow period where Moore's Law is a bunch of challenges. It's like, how do you take this end of, or these, you know, the unique dynamics of where we're at with the scaling uh, of uh, CMOS and really look at that as an opportunity and how do you uh, get creative and how do you get, you know, not say, well, we're just going to push into the software stack and just do a bunch of work there on, on a stagnant uh, electronic space. How do we actually look at all of the different vectors of, of progress from the design community, from uh, novel devices, from packaging, and how do we build a uh, collective national effort, uh, which we branded uh, ERI. What's interesting to me is we used to sit in the Pentagon or at, at DARPA and think, how do we engage with commercial industry? You know, they've got their global multinationals, they're doing their thing. You know, here we have a bunch of defense I, I think I, I actually hit the dial um, the moment you're talking. And so, 
um, we would sit there and try to figure out how are we going to uh, work, you know, across these lines. Government has certain needs, commercial have different needs, and sometimes they're at odds. The pace of development, you know, are at odds. But here you sit, you know, 10 years later from some of those conversations, and there's deep partnerships between the government and uh, industry. People are squarely focused on supply chain, whether you're developing chips or not. Uh, across the entire stack, there's an intense focus on where the chips are going to come from. Uh, what is the workforce that's going to develop those chips? And how do you make sure you have a diversity uh, across uh, the globe? And so uh, it's been an interesting decade from those early conversations of how do we actually engage to where we're set today, where you know, we very uh, easily were able to pull together a panel of, of experts because they care enough that they really want to have their voice uh, heard. Whereas in the past, it was like, hey, how do we have this discussion between government and, uh, and industry. So even at Microsoft, we are the end of the cycle, right? meaning you know, we just announced our uh, top secret cloud working for the government as an example. Um, obviously then the chips that go into that, right? we care a lot about that, in, that entire chain. And so whether we're designing chips or not, we have to be a part of this entire cycle. So people like me, um, you know, with an electrical engineering background, he's to be a professor at Purdue, right, are uh, part of, you know, what has historically been part of the software uh, portion of the ecosystem and intensely focused on uh, the chips that are being developed and how we make sure that they're getting into our, our systems uh, securely. So today we will walk through the different uh, perspectives and I'm going to start with Deidre. Uh, Deidre has a lot to say about um, the role of design but she's really just an expert who's been a part of this community from, uh, from the very, uh, I won't say the beginning because I don't want to talk about your age, but you've been there for as long <laughs> as I've been paying attention. You're a, a, a pillar of the community. So I'm very interested to hear where you are. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on this moment in time? Thank you so much, Phil. And thank you all to, the, to all of our colleagues at Purdue and in the industry for the opportunity to speak today. And Bill wanted us to talk about what's going on in this moment of time. So let me just spend a few minutes setting the stage from an EDA company's perspective. So, you know, I'm an executive in an EDA company. I've been at Synopsys for 34 years now. So I've grown up in this industry enabling the breakneck pace of design. So, you know, you have fabulous companies driving the state of the art. Now you increasingly have high performance compute, hyperscaler companies going vertical, following the course of companies like Apple that brought a lot of chip design in-house. You've got foundries that are pushing us constantly to, you know, now we're taping out five nanometer designs and the industry's moving to three nanometer and 18 angstrom. We're now in the age of angstrom, which is kind of remarkable. And, you know, when you look at the, that performance that drives, you know, a whole cycle of innovation on an ongoing basis. Of course, the feature rich companies are designing at more mature nodes and really, really driving innovation in their own way. So all of this puts the EDA and the IP industry at the middle of that innovation. And our job is really to work with foundries and researchers and equipment companies to pathfind on new methodologies, new materials, new technologies, so we can drive that state of the art. But we also need to work with our fabulous and hyperscaler companies to make sure that we are providing the ability to integrate all that into you know, a design flow where the chip can actually get done. Um, Bill actually mentioned something important that EDA is actually a treasured industry here in the United States. 80% of our industry revenue is US based. And we need to make sure that we recognize that when we look at all the challenges in our industry and our vertical, we need to recognize that EDA is a true strength for um, this whole ecosystem. So that's kind of the normal circle of life, as I call it. You know, we go to management review meetings with our foundry partners and they talk about the next generation technology and we say, oh my gosh, this is gonna be another tough road. And somehow we get it done collectively. But Bill didn't want us to wax on too much about kind of state of the present. Uh, so I wanna talk about three trends that I see. One is 3D IC and heterogeneous integration. And I think we've been to many conferences this year, all virtual, unfortunately, although some of them are becoming live, where we're starting to see you know, what, what pioneers did like Xilinx a few years ago and AMD has done. We need to broaden that capability 
uh, beyond kind of the leaders that can drive state of the art um, in advanced packaging and heterogeneous integration. We need to make that available through, through chiplet methodologies, through more advanced design flows, through verification capabilities, et cetera. So I think we'll hear more about that from other parties on the panel. I think we also have an opportunity, number two, for new methods. And AI and cloud are absolutely here. Uh, this is going to drive the next level of productivity and capability for our industry. And it's something that we're going to see truly accelerate over the next decade. So I'm really excited about uh, the opportunities that that presents. And then I really, as chief security officer at Synopsys, I need to comment on supply chain security. And I think we'll hear from Sri later about, you know, in the CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. There's a lot of obsession right now about availability. Now that's absolutely a, a consideration, but we need to think about confidentiality and integrity in supply chain security as well. And so we need to think about designing, designing securely, manufacturing securely, and then monitoring a device throughout its life cycle. And this is also a new trend that our partners in defense industrial base know very well. They understand that parts need to be secure and, and reliable, but more and more industries like automotive, like high performance compute are realizing that this is an, a trend that we absolutely need to comprehend in our overall design flow. So I feel a lot of excitement about what's happening in our industry, but I also feel a huge amount of urgency because we need to maintain that innovative edge um, as we go forward in the next decade. That's it, Bill, back to you. Or as they would say in government calls, over. That's great. Thanks, Deidre. Um, look forward to asking you questions about some of the statements you made there, but we're gonna move on to uh, Chandra, um, representing the memory space, uh, but also uh, a deep expert across the entire semiconductor uh, industry. So Chandra, over to you. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, thanks uh, for all the panelists to join this discussion today. Um, I want to focus on memory as a critical ingredient in the whole supply chain and specifically talk about you know, where we are in time today in the memory industry. As everybody knows in this panel, right, um, every semiconductor company, if you historically look at it, you know, has been doing memory, right? In Intel brought the first DRAM chip to the world, right? So everybody has worked on memory. You know, quite literally, I can count more than 40, 50 companies working on various aspects of memory technology. But today, if you look at it in time, you know, Micron is the number one and the only one memory company in the Western world. Okay. So if you really look at, you know, where we are, I won't go through the list of, you know, our competition. Largely, I would say, you know, we face significant competition from Korea, right? In Korea, memory industry is a national initiative. I mean, you know, it's really been like that for several years. And of course, um, we are competing with them head on. And I'm proud to say, you know, in, in, in Micron, you know, we have absolutely best in class memory products in both DRAM and, and NAND space. And various aspects related to, you know, variety of different memory products that we develop for the industries in various segments, in uh, compute, in mobile, in automotive, in graphics, and whole, whole bunch of areas. Now, if you look at where we are today in time, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are, of course, facing a lot of competition from Korea, and our scaling challenges are immense. Um, as, as everybody knows in this panel, you know, we have try to break away from the lithography roadmap to really make vertical structures. Um, in NAND, you know, it's well known that we have moved to 3D. The industry as a whole has moved to 3D. And uh, we are continuing to build, you know, massive skyscrapers, if you will, right? With, you know, enormous aspect ratio structures. In DRAM, we are facing huge challenges as well in terms of scaling. Um, of course, you know, a lot of these scaling challenges that we face are being addressed by Variety of different fields, right? You know, memory management, for example, has been a very, very integral part of, you know, where we are moving as an industry. Now, what that brings up uh, at a high level is uh, the diversity of uh, talent that we need, right? In, uh, in, in the memory technology space, you know, we are an integrated device manufacturer, right? I've been with Micron for more than 25 years now. And I can tell you, we have faced competition um, significantly at various phases in the company's uh, history. 
uh, enormous competition from Japan initially, right? When Micron started, you know, that was our biggest competition. And then of course, uh, moving on to China, uh, to uh, Korea and, and, and moving forward, it will be China for sure. So we face a lot of competition from Asia and um, really where we are today in terms of technology, as I mentioned, you know, we are to, to some extent, I would say, you know, benefiting by having, you know, exceptional memory management techniques. And that kind of brings the diversity in, in terms of the talent that we need, right? Memory technology historically has focused on yield and will continue to be, you know, we are a uh, heavy manufacturing company as well. So we have to focus on cost, high yield, all of that. But look at where we are today. We are pretty much, you know, in the material space, touching almost every element in the periodic table, right? It's incredible how, how vast we are, you know, touching the material science space. In the, in the devices area, of course, you know, continued scaling um, poses a lot of challenges. As I mentioned, you know, vertical structures are not trivial to make, right? And in high volume in manufacturable uh, manner. Now, when we look at um, memory management space, again, you know, we are bringing enormous disciplines converging into this space. Uh, we need talent in, you know, areas like signal processing, for example, which was traditionally not part of the memory technology industry as a whole, right? So we need experts in various disciplines from, you know, covering a wide gamut of, you know, spectrum from material science to devices to circuits and innovative techniques of memory management, uh, software and firmware and algorithms. So we are touching every area and our competition again, as I said, you know, is largely um, outside uh, the US. And so that's kind of where we are today in, in terms of uh, the state of uh, where we are in the industry. The last thing I wanted to kind of mention briefly is, um, you know, probably will be a good discussion in the panel today, is we have in the memory industry touched upon variety of different, you know, emerging memory technologies in the past, right? You know, we have seen if you open any you know, technical uh, journal, you would see um, a huge chunk of you know, memory, memory technologies that are being advertised as the next holy grail in, in terms of scaling and replacing you know, the, the, the traditional DRAM and NAND. Now, where are we there, right? So a lot of these memory segments have gone into lower densities, you know, embedded space, for example. Um, those are the proving grounds, if you will, right? but they have never really matured to get to a point of you know, high volume commodity type space. Now I say commodity in a very loose sense, you know, certainly memory is there everywhere, right? You know, Bill mentioned about various areas of uh, cloud and you know, computing space and graphics and automotive. I mean, it's a very, very wide segment that we try to cover, right? Memory is there everywhere at various levels, various densities. It's also true that the you know, operating systems that these devices use in IoT systems, for example, are, are, are different, right? The specs are gonna be different as well. So in terms of the emerging memory area, if you look at it, right, really DRAM as we know it um, is, is uh, really where it is today because of the strength of the simplicity in the technology and the ability for us to you know, continue pushing scaling and continue pushing um, our products through good, good uh, memory management as well. That's going to continue. It's not going to drop off. Having said that, you know, at some point we're going to be looking at, you know, replacement of these technologies, or I would say more displacement of these technologies. So we cannot ignore the emerging memory space. What that puts us um, is the heavy burden of R&D that we have to invest, right? It's a huge investment that we need to make. There are not many companies that are going to be doing that. And again, in the Western, Western world, entire Western world, Micron is the only company doing a lot of this work. We have fantastic facilities in our R&D centers in Boise and various other manufacturing locations. And the cost of doing this R&D, cost of doing you know, down selection, for example, in the pathfinding space is enormous for us. So we face a lot of challenges um, as, a, as, a, as a company. We face challenge from a country, not a company, right? Korea is really managing this as a, as a national initiative. Um, and, and, and that's def definitely going to be a challenge. And increasingly, we're going to see that from China. There are a lot of investments in this, uh, in, in China as well. So we're going to face that challenge. And we can only win this by really being very, very smart in how we invest. Very, very smart in how we do R&D. That's the only way to our success. 
And we are well positioned really, uh, I would say, to really do that. But we, we can get all the help we can from the universities, from, uh, from you know, talent pool that we create from various spectrum, as I mentioned. We need at the very end of the spectrum, you know, really high, high talent uh, pool uh, that we need to absorb in the company to uh, go forward in our technologies. We also need, you know, technicians and operators who are trained in, uh, in uh, you know, day-to-day -day operations of uh, manufacturing, as well as uh, yield improvement and other areas of data science and AI, which is really coming into place to develop our technology. So we need wide spectrum of uh, talent pool. And uh, we, are, we are really going to be dependent on a lot of that, you know, coming from the, the US. So our supply chain, as, a, as someone mentioned earlier, is really, um, you know, going to be the weak, weak link is going to be the problem for us, right? There are certain weak links and certainly talent pool is, is one of the weak links that we are concerned about. So with that, I will stop and uh, hand it over to Bill uh, for additional thoughts from others. Thanks, Ishandra. So we're going to move on to Mark Papermaster and Mark uh, formerly at Apple uh, and helping pivot towards some of the verticalization you see within industry, but now at AMD, uh, you know, growing rapidly uh, there. So Mark, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing. Thanks, Bill. And uh, thanks to you and uh, Purdue University and Mark for inviting me onto the panel. Look forward to the discussion today. Well, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I'll start with the topic that Ron in terms of uh, semiconductor technology, the supply chain and, and you know, where that uh, has influence on, you know, our country going forward and some of the key factors. And I have to now date myself. You mentioned uh, that. I, so I'm a 40 year veteran coming on uh, next year in the industry. I met my wife, who's a, a product of the STEM education back at, at that time, electrical and computer engineer like myself. And it was the heyday of semiconductors. I mean, we joined the field when it was expanding. Uh, the technologies uh, were, were changing from bipolar transistors to uh, the, the CMOS uh, approaches that uh, now have, have lasted uh, decades, although uh, modifications. And it was, it was just such an exciting area uh, to be in. And who would have thought almost 40 years later that there's a rebirth in our industry? Uh, yet... Uh, we face challenges that we have to, to take on. Uh, we have to take on uh, innovation uh, because Moore's law is slowing. So that traditional benefit we used to get from each new semiconductor node uh, naturally propelling us forward with uh, you know, just great gains of uh, energy efficiency and higher performance, yet at the same uh, cost uh, range per transistor, uh, those days are gone. Uh, you, don't, you, still have a great, you know, still have a high dependency on new semiconductor nodes uh, but uh, we don't get that same degree of gain and the cost per transistor has been going up now several generations. And uh, you look at that and it, and it uh, drives a need for uh, more innovative approaches. And you know, again, innovation is the king of our industry. Uh, being around a while, I can tell you, I've already uh, been through several, I'll say near death experiences for our industry. And what do I mean by that? I mean, uh, I remember where we hit um, the micron limit with semiconductor lithography, where we thought we couldn't even get to below that type of, of uh, miniaturization on our chip designs. And of course, uh, every time we hit uh, any one of those uh, barriers, innovation went out at the end of the day. And we're, we're very focused on that uh, at AMD. It's about, uh, in fact, uh, Deirdre mentioned it earlier, uh, what, what are we doing to progress high performance computing? Of course, we invest in partnering on semiconductor technology, but we think about differently how we put the solutions together. It, of course, it's CPU, that general purpose processor, but pairing it with accelerators like uh, GPUs and, and other uh, focused accelerators. Uh, packaging it in different ways. We've, uh, we're an early uh, adopter in the industry, one of the first adopters of a chiplet approach so that you can mix and match uh, different technologies as well as different types of, of computing elements together in a more facile way. And so the, you know, these, are, uh, you know, these are the kind of uh, innovations that will continue. And so it's just amazing to me that uh, an industry that, that I thought by the time I, I reached uh, this point in my career, uh, might be getting a little stale, uh, is just at a peak of excitement. And the reason is, is that society needs us because you see those embedded devices all around us. We've got uh, in the factory floor, it's all smart devices. We've got telemetry. We're optimizing our manufacturing flows. 
Uh, we have it at, at work. We're collecting uh, data and, and putting that data to work with advanced analytics and, and uh, AI. AI is a huge consumer of high performance computing to both manage those big data sets and, and train them and put them to work. And then inferencing where, you know, on the fly, you're using it uh, uh, for analytics. And then of course, our home lives. Uh, think about uh, the kind of computing we all want. We want realistic uh, life visuals as we see one in, another. Uh, soon we'll be uh, all uh, avatars in the metaverse as we're in this time of, uh, type of meeting. So there's an explosion of data there's, you know, in, in uh, a whole different set of demands that we have of how we want to uh, put that data to work for us and then how we use computing to interface on a, on a daily basis. So, wow, you know, what, what a great time. But <laughs> there's an existential uh, threat that we all face in industry, and that is uh, we can't continue that pace of innovation uh, without uh, both uh, a growth in the skill pool and uh, appropriate collaboration, collaboration that drives innovation. So let's take just a minute and talk about the skill pool. Well, uh, you know, I'll tell you just at AMD, uh, you know, in the U.S. alone, so we're a big company, we're a global company, uh, we've been growing leaps and bounds. Uh, we hired over uh, 600 engineers out of our, uh, you know, 4,000, uh, uh, some in the U.S. alone. Again, I'm talking only U.S. We hired over 600 in 20, uh, uh, 21, we're uh, projecting to hire over 600 in 2022. And what we're finding is it's extremely difficult uh, to find the skills that we need in, in uh, chip design, uh, like Chandra was talking about, uh, advanced uh, you know, techniques and signaling, uh, you know, skills uh, out of uh, Deirdre's uh, side that are, are uh, very adept uh, in leveraging the electronic design automation tools so that we can verify these designs so that we can, in facile ways, put them together. So skills, it turns out, uh, is fundamental uh, for us to be able to keep this momentum and satisfy this explosive uh, demand for high performance computing. And really, it's going to take a concerted effort by all of us. We're going to have to start at, at K through 12. Uh, if we want to uh, take this excitement that we all see in front of us and translate it uh, down to, uh, you know, getting more enrollment in our engineering uh, 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 curricula, then we have to convey that excitement of uh, our technology field, of semiconductors and putting together uh, semiconductor-based uh, solutions. Uh, by the way, putting together semiconductor solutions is both hardware and software skills it takes to do that. So it's multidisciplinary. And I will say, you know, I chose uh, electrical and computer engineering uh, decades ago because it was uh, a degree uh, that could apply to solving a vast set of problems that couldn't be more uh, true today. So any of the branches of engineering or, uh, you know, programming, you know, is such an exciting area and one that that uh, students can apply themselves uh, in such challenging pr uh, problems uh, that, will, that will be in front of them the entire lifetime. So we have to band together and, and get that story out to K to 12, uh, but we have to do more than that. Uh, we need to partner on university programs. Uh, this is so uh, the academia uh, industry uh, partnership is critical to share the kind of problems that we see. We're often at the cutting edge of uh, what uh, consumers, whether in their commercial or their personalized, what the consumers need for computing. So we need to, to share that, get that problem set in front of uh, academia. And uh, as well, uh, partnership with uh, uh, government. I can't say enough about what, uh, how important that is in the US. I'll use an example of what we did at AMD in terms of collaboration with the US Department of Energy. Uh, fundamental for the turnaround that Bill mentioned at AMD. 10 years ago uh, is when I stepped in in this role at the CTO at AMD. And the team here had already started working uh, just then with the Department of Energy. And we put a bet in uh, for what was the start of what became the Exascale program. It was the fast forward. And we were given a grant to work on high performance computing approaches. And we proposed heterogeneous computing, how CPU and GPUs could work together very, very efficiently to advance high performance computing. Uh, we got several other grants and then ultimately uh, won the bid to supply the CPU and GPU uh, for what will be uh, the uh, uh, we expect to be the largest supercomputers that stood up in Oak Ridge National Lab uh, uh, in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, this fall. It's being stood up right now and, and being brought up in production with our partners in, uh, in Hewlett uh, Packard Enterprise and Oak Ridge National Lab. So 
we all need to partner together uh, to create the right uh, skill pool uh, from K to 12 to college programs, to retraining, to uh, really thinking about uh, integration, uh, immigration and our policies there. Uh, we need to focus on collaboration, how we're working together across industry, with universities, with government. If we do that, if we can get our arms around how we work together and how we build the skill pool, then I see an incredibly bright future uh, for how we will drive innovation forward in the US uh, and the world uh, to continue to suffice that uh, exploding demand of computation in society. Thanks, and with that, Bill, back to you. Great, yeah, great comments, Mark. Well, I'm gonna uh, go next to Thomas, uh, uh, the President and CEO of Skywater uh, Technology to represent his portion of the sector, and then we'll finish with Sri. Thanks, Bill. Uh, it's a pleasure to join Purdue, uh, the Department of Commerce, and all my colleagues from industry and academia. Uh, it's always exciting to hear uh, people like Mark and others talk about what they're seeing. Um, I'm sure many of you on the call are wondering who Skywater is. Uh, Skywater is a US-based and solely US investor-owned DMEA accredited pure play foundry. We specialize in advanced innovation engineering services and volume manufacturing across a wide variety of integrated circuits. Uh, ironically, I began my career at AMD uh, 30 plus years ago. I was part of the team that created Global Foundries. And one of the things that is exciting about Skywater uh, is that we also spun out of a, another company, Cypress Semiconductor, and are really bringing a lot of unique ideas and capabilities uh, to the aerospace and defense, automotive, computation, consumer, industrial, and med device markets. One of the things uh, that we're very proud of at Skywater is we pioneer what we call our technology foundry model. Skywater is a trusted innovation partner and in many ways the trusted innovation partner for many of the specialized computational capabilities uh, that are being brought to market. We leverage our heritage of a CMOS platform that has been running for many years at our fab in Minnesota. And that capability is allowing us to bring new emerging technologies like superconducting, photonics, and carbon nanotube-derived 3D SOCs uh, to market. We have, again, a decade, decades of heritage uh, with innovation uh, services. And our whole goal is really to help customers efficiently develop and scale uh, their next generation products, again, here domestically uh, within the United States. So while all of us recognize the unique moment we find ourselves in with the heightened awareness of the criticality of our industry and the importance of uh, the bipartisan uh, support we're getting from the government to regain America's prominent status as a leading semiconductor manufacturer, I believe you could all say in part that Skywater is a product of this national uh, reawakening. Back in 2017, when we were spun out of Cyprus, uh, a lot of what we were doing seemed somewhat absurd, trying to bring a, a foundry capability uh, back uh, to the United States. That said, uh, under the last administration, industry veterans like Purdue's Dean Chung, uh, who we heard from earlier, uh, who was serving in the State Department, Ian Steff, a uh, former Assistant Secretary at the Department of Com Commerce, and others were all amplifying these messages that uh, our industry and the U.S. government must begin to emphasize the need for America companies, American companies, to really step up their domestic semiconductor manufacturing efforts. So the growing momentum uh, that this created really helped establish Skywater as an effective domestic foundry and solution provider to both commercial and government uh, partners. This momentum has also led to a growing chorus in Congress championed by uh, senators like Todd Young from Indiana, Chuck Schumer, of course, who's been pushing this heavily for New York and others uh, to really create the funding infusion that America is gonna require if we're gonna regain our footing in this space. Uh, it's important to remember that semiconductors were created in America. Uh, th this is a legacy that we own. Uh, we, we still have a lot of capabilities uh, here that we can leverage, but uh, we cannot 
lose sight of the importance of manufacturing. Great countries manufacture things, and we need to be a manufacturer of semiconductors. Uh, since January, the uh, leadership, under the leadership of President Biden, Secretary Raimondo, we've gotten to the point where passage of the CHIPS Act and USICA uh, seems very likely. Uh, I think it's a privilege uh, to be able to join this panel with Sri, representing the Department of Commerce, who's worked diligently with Skywater and other industry partners to fully understand the challenges we face in the business environment and with workforce development. In the end, our ability to bring back semiconductor manufacturing to the U.S. will be completely dependent on not only investment, but creating a workforce uh, that can enable uh, the scale that we envision. From a Skywater perspective, with a growing uh, wafer fab uh, here in the Midwest and an advanced packaging facility in Florida, uh, the state of the U.S. semiconductor industry uh, in many ways can be characterized as challenged, outgunned by foreign interest and their strong incentive programs and in dire need of a two-pronged strategy. The first is how do we grow domestic innovation and capacity fulfillment in the near term? And the second is how do we disrupt the lead the Far East has on this industry and retake this leadership role here in the United States. And the next you know, six to eight, 18 months, uh, FAB just won't come online quick enough to address a lot of the domestic supply chain shortages we're seeing. There are some unique, albeit expensive, repurposing of clean room spaces that can be combined with tool purchases to increase capacity uh, that will help alleviate uh, the shortage in the, you know, the short term. But in the long term, it's not just about adding capacity which gets a lot of attention, frankly, in the press. The most important thing we need to do is promote innovation on rapidly, to rapidly realize the potential of disruptive new technologies like advanced packaging, like superconducting and carbon nanotube derived computational platforms that will allow us to leapfrog the state of the art while in parallel creating an end-to-end -end domestic value chain. We don't just wanna make wafers in the US, we need to, you know, do the complete value chain, final assembly and test. Everything needs to be contained here uh, within our country. Second, and, and very importantly, we need to seed the workforce uh, of the future with educational programs and curricula like Purdue's new microelectronics program uh, that Dean Chung talked about uh, that will lead to the creation of a ready to work talent pool that will populate the new R&D centers and fabs that our country intends to fund and allow us to create a world-class American high-tech manufacturing capability for decades to come. So I look forward to the discussion on the panel and hope we all leave re-energized about what we can accomplish together. Uh, we need a willingness to advocate for the passage of the critical legislation that will transform our industry and double down on our support for educational institutions like Purdue, Notre Dame, and others who are promoting the fields of study that will enable an American high-tech manufacturing revival. That's it. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, all right, last but not least, um, you know, the epicenter of a lot of these discussions and where it's collapsing into the government is Sri. So Sri, uh, no, no pressure, but uh, tell us about where, uh, uh, where you're seeing it from your government uh, stance right now. Thank you, Bill. No, yeah, no, no pressure. Um, and thank you for inviting me. I, I, um, I'm excited to join and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I, I agree with Tom. I mean, this is, this is obviously a unique moment in time. I mean, we're seriously contemplating, you know, 52 billion in financial assistance for this industry, you know, and, and uh, folks on Capitol Hill, folks in the administration, in industry, in, in academia, national security, everybody is rowing in the same direction to get this done. That is really quite amazing. Um, from where I stand, um, I think we're at a crossroads. I think we, there are two paths forward and to be perfectly honest with this group, it is not entirely clear to me which path we are going to take. There is the one path where we, we collectively seize this moment. We focus on systemic transformation, we focus on changing the underlying economics, we create new collaborations, you know, we deal with the structural barriers. And so we end up with you know, long-term investments in R&D and manufacturing instead of short-term subsidies. We end up with open technology and R&D roadmaps instead of walled gardens. 
We end up with massive productivity gains instead of massive cost escalations. We end up with you know, workforce programs at huge scale and coordination instead of you know, individual fragmented initiatives. Um, and you know, we end up with a secure supply chain that promotes confidentiality and integrity instead of a single sourced foreign choke point that promotes none of that. That's one part. There is another part where we collectively decide that getting the 52 billion and getting to this point was in fact the big lift. And that from here on, it is about figuring out individual programs to spend the money as fast as we can. We disperse it as widely as we can. We focus on essentially minimizing the risk of getting things wrong. Um, and that, you know, that has its own advantages. It will help make a thousand flowers bloom. But whether that brings new approaches, you know, or do we end up mostly doing the same things that we've done in the past, but with more money, um, whether that's on workforce or R&D or anything else that remains to be seen. Like whether it brings that lasting transformation or, you know, do we end up losing the forest for the trees? I think that remains to be seen. So I think that's the challenge from, from and that's certainly the challenge that I've been posing in my conversations with industry, with academia, with my own colleagues in government. Which, which way do we go? What is the, if we go with that first path, then what is that new thinking? What is that new industry structure that we are trying to get that supports both the large firms and the small firms and the established ones and the new ones? What are those platforms that will support the collaborations that Mark was talking about? You know, are there going to be new partnerships? Are there going to be new consortia, whether that's across company boundaries or across state boundaries? Are we going to see new things emerging? Is there going to be coordination on, on the security and confidentiality, as Dito was suggesting, or on energy efficiency or on heterogeneous integration? Right? Are, they, are we going to see new structures and new initiatives? Will there be scale and stickiness, or, or will it be... Will it be what we've seen in the last few years, except with more money thrown at it? I think that's, that's where we are. That, that's yet to be determined. And how we choose one path over the other is, is kind of the, is the focus of the discussion. Thanks, Sri. Um, all right. So what I heard, a uh, couple of different things, but one of the things is you know, this need for innovation. Yeah, you know, I, I would characterize the electronics industry as incredibly nerdy. And I say that, you know, as one of those nerds that has been driving uh, the world, right? We literally have lifted the world on our shoulders. Um, and we've done it all the while while he's talking about the doom and gloom of the end of our, you know, industry and end of Moore's law, like literally end of Moore's law is like five years away for the last 30 years or more, right? Uh, all the while, like we have transformed right, the entire globe to, you know, use the products that are the basis of, of Moore's law. So here we are again, right? It is a actually a moment of inflection. We're seeing the strains of you know, the, the advanced CMOS um, uh, scaling challenges. And it's not like a something that uh, stops at all. I think it's actually something that then just fosters an incredible amount of innovation. So instead of doom and gloom, you know, like how do you pivot this so that innovation, right, is actually the fun part Right. And I would actually characterize Moore's law as incredibly boring. Right. So like, here you go. It's been, you know, the epicenter and the, the center of society, yet it's a roadmap. Right. And as a researcher, it's like, okay, roadmaps are good, but you know, what I really want to do is like invent, you know, novel things and, and into the future. And I think this is the opportunity we have. And so it is exciting. So what I want to do is go through the panel and talk about where you see innovation in the next five to 10 years in your particular area. I'm going to start with Deidre. I'll ask the panel to be fairly um, concise here, and then we'll start a conversation around your answers. So in EDA in five to 10 years, if this is the moment where innovation is going to spark uh, this revolution, uh, what is it in EDA that's going to uh, make that uh, happen? I think I, you know, in my opening remarks, I think I touched on some of the big discontinuities that we need to address. So, so briefly on things like 3DIC and heterogeneous integration, you know, we've got to really start to think about reliability, testability, the thermal envelope for these devices. In order to do a lot of that, you need to understand the actual workloads that are going to be driven on these. So, you know, the EDA industry is, is, is created with a whole host of magnificent point tools that need to be leveraged in a broad-based systemic way. And so we need our engineers to be able to drive those tools, as I think we heard Mark comment on earlier. But I think we need to start to think about, yes, bigger chips, more complex chips, but also you know, systems of chips truly. So that's kind of number one. Number two, when I look at um, 
you know, this notion of security, it reminds me of when we were trying to design for low power a decade ago, uh, as devices were becoming more mobile. And people, you know, I remember being in an exec dinner in Taiwan, and people were bombarding me like I need to design for low power, how the heck do I do it? And then gradually, the, 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 the tooling came online, and the, um, the knowledge came online. And I think for in design for security, we're going to need to bring up that level of capability. And that's gonna be a big challenge because you know, security is not a closed form problem. You know, it's a very open form problem. And we, you know, there's the, the threat landscape is constantly evolving. You know, if you think about things like post-quantum cryptography, we're gonna have a big issue in you know, protecting our, you know, the, the banking that we do on our devices over the next decade. We need to solve these types of problems. So I think the, the EDA and IP industry need to be you know, constantly doing our job, which is to understand all the innovation that's occurring out there and making sure that we are comprehending that in our solution so that people can, you know, as, as I've talked to three about before, fill those fabs with amazing designs. And you know, the last one I would say is, you know, it, it, in, in universities, I think a lot of electrical engineering departments are saying that you know, e, uh, CS is eating the world, you know, CS is taking over on a lot of um, degree programs over electrical engineering. So we need to stem that tide. But in the industry is AI taking over the world. And I think in EDA, AI is a booster. AI is not a, um, is, isn't going to take out all the engineers out there. But I think that's another discussion hopefully we get into. Back to you, Bill. That's great, Deidre. Um, you know, so Chandra, in memory, Right, you mentioned a couple of vectors you think are, are interesting. If you had to pick one in that five year time frame, like what is it that you're excited about that's going to uh, spark a revolution in technology? Yeah, so Bill, um, when I look at memory today, um, the I will give a, 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 an example that everybody's aware, aware of, right? When planar NAND um, technology was reaching pretty much its limits, right? Um, you could argue whether it is a physical limit or, you know, is it uh, something else? But basically, we, we could not really have multi-bit cells with uh, planar uh, NAND, with incredibly small volume of silicon. Um, so we had to, to come up with a solution, right? So the industry really rallied around and uh, uh, came up with the 3D NAND solution. And so we went vertical, right? So that's gonna continue and the trend is continuing and you, you can see the revolution cost because of that, right? You know, uh, we, are, we are all taking for granted, you know, the incredible amount of densities that we have in storage class memory, but it's all, it's all possible because of two things, right? Vertical scaling, as well as, you know, ability for us to um, do multi-level cells. Okay. Now, the biggest challenge I see in the next coming, coming years is gonna be what's gonna happen in DRAM, right? So in DRAM, we are in a very, very uh, critical inflection point. Um, again, you know, historically, when you look at it and you say, oh, you know, we have talked about end of scaling in DRAM for decades, right? Um, but jokes apart, right? We have continued to push this and, you know, in, through many, many ways that I mentioned briefly earlier, um, but we are really getting to a point where as an industry as a whole, you know, we are facing challenges with scaling and we need to come up with innovative solutions. Now, many people have come to me and said, hey, you know, Micron, uh, you, you, you guys have a wrong name for the company, right? You know, Micron, what does it mean, right? And I say, no, we, we don't, we have the right name. You know, our die size is few microns now, right? We are not talking about individual transistors anymore. We are talking about, you know, entire die becoming, you know, so small. So innovation is going to be very, very critical. And, and I think in that area as well, right, my, my uh, input to this panel would be to say, we need, you know, ability to do incredibly rapid prototyping, right? Very quickly determine if this is a wrong path to go, we need to know that soon, right? We cannot be spending years on end in a path and then say, hmm, this is not gonna work. So how can we do that effectively? Now, can we do this alone? Uh, in my opinion, we cannot, we have traditionally been very, it's a very competitive industry, right? Everybody, we all in our own space face a lot of competition. So we have to be careful to protect our IP, protect our you know, uh, technologies, all of that. But we cannot be in this continuous mode of walled garden where we say, well, we'll try to do everything ourselves. The reason I say that is 
you know, Micron is a unique company in the memory space, particularly, I would say, because we don't compete with our customers, right? We have partnership with a lot of our customers. And when we look at, you know, product enablement, whether it is chiplets, whether it is package level innovations, uh, system level integration, right? You know, system level co-optimizations are becoming extremely critical and we can't do this alone, right? We have to have the right partnerships and we need to do this quickly. So two things I would say, rapid prototyping, identifying fail, fails quickly, and then moving on to, you know, more promising areas uh, is, is going to be critical. So we need, you know, infrastructure that allows us to do that. And then partnerships with uh, companies that can collaborate with us uh, instead of being in this complete silo um, is, is not going to work going forward, I feel. So I think that's going to be very critical as well. Thanks, Chandra. That's great. Um, Mark, um, CPU design packaging sort of your world. Um, you know, you're going through something right now, which I think is pretty exciting in terms of chiplet integration and, and whatnot, as you mentioned. Project a little bit further out, five to 10 years. Um, do you see an evolution of that um, that drives it or where, where do you see innovation really um, you know, flipping the script on, on how you're doing things today? You're on mute, Mark. There we go. Yeah, it's not by any means a temporary uh, phenomenon that we're seeing right now in terms of this uh, move to a chiplet modular based approach. I mean, it is a, a fundamental in terms of how we're going to keep uh, performance scaling, uh, you know, yet given the uh, some of the uh, device uh, phenomena that I described earlier. So it's here to stay. Uh, it is both, uh, you know, horizontal uh, connectivity. It's vertical connectivity. We just announced our 3D vCache where we stack uh, SRAM uh, directly over our CPUs with what's called hybrid bonding. So that was a major innovation that we worked on, uh, you know, with the uh, packaging industry uh, such that you have, uh, you know, really silicon to silicon connectivity. And so here we are stacking up vertically um, and by the way, adding memory closer, cache memory closer to a processor is a fundamental way to drive more performance. And so, you know, the, again, there was an example of uh, technology innovation and collaboration. And we're doing the same thing laterally. Uh, and it is uh, working with the foundries, uh, working with the um, global packaging community uh, to be able to uh, laterally stitch together these modular chiplets. So uh, one of the uh, blogs in, uh, in uh, Hyperscale, Google, uh, had, uh, had an article by me in there that he said that the, the package is the new motherboard. And motherboards, of course, are the, you know, the, the big boards you see all the discrete electronics uh, packaged on today, and that's collapsing into the package. So uh, innovation uh, will continue on our CPUs, our graphics processors, specialized accelerators. Uh, we're going to innovate on uh, how we uh, put these together horizontally uh, and vertically. Uh, and again, uh, it's gotta be collaboration. Sri mentioned a, a choke point. We can't have a choke point. It is, it is gonna be uh, geographically diverse as to how these solutions are put together, but diversity needs to include the US. Right? So we need uh, you know, US components of, of how this is built, but it will remain international. Uh, and, and the collaboration uh, will remain such that we need standards, uh, bodies uh, that can agree. We're working now with several uh, of our partners and, and, and competitors in the industry so that we standardize on how these modular chiplets can talk together. Just like years ago, we standardized at, at those big motherboards of how, uh, you know, uh, the discrete components would talk with one another. Uh, so uh, a lot of innovation yet to go. Uh, it is going to continue on this approach you've seen with both uh, horizontal and, and vertical advanced integration. And I want to underscore uh, the points Deirdre made. We need a lot of analytics and capability and facility uh, and, and AI. AI is by no means does, it replaces the smarts of the engineers we need putting these solutions together. The complexity has grown uh, such that we have just so many, uh, you know, uh, billions and billions of transistors that without AI to facilitate how we put these solutions together, it becomes an intractable problem. So uh, lots of innovation yet to go, Bill. Uh, and, and again, it's going to take many uh, facets coming together to keep us on pace. That's great. All right. So Thomas, you mentioned some already. Um, as a, I'd say, very flexible uh, foundry, we've uh, been able to 
tap into you to be able to uh, do some pathfinding, but also do some scale manufacturing. So if you just pick one um, what, that you're most excited about, uh, tell us which one you're, uh, that would be. Yeah, great question, Bill. And this is one near and dear to your heart. Uh, the program we're doing with MIT and Stanford for carbon nanotube based 3D SOC with embedded RERAM is a perfect example of uh, fresh thinking, bringing a disruptive uh, new paradigm to potentially reset uh, Moore's law in a way that could not only create you know, renewed leadership here in the US, but provide a lot of new capability. Uh, from this functionality. So uh, just you know, at a very high level, what we're essentially doing is taking a, a 90 nanometer process flow and also a 130 nanometer process flow. We're working on both. And at the back end of the line, we're adding carbon nanotube uh, field effect transistors that then get coupled with resistive RAM to provide uh, additional computational power to that core CMOS capability. Uh, the you know data to date is showing sub 10 nanometer type performance for edge based AI processors. Again, leveraging a 90 nanometer platform. So it's somewhat analogous to how uh, our country used fracking technology to regain a certain degree of energy independence. Uh, by taking a disruptive technology, this is actually through a DARPA funded initiative, uh, like carbon nanotubes, adding them to a legacy or mature node technology, uh, we can deliver, you know, a leading edge performance at a fraction of the cost, uh, the designs to bring a capability like this to market, again, are a fraction of the costs uh, that a company like, say, AMD would have to pay to leverage a five nanometer design. And it also uh, enables AI at the edge, which is very important, not only for military applications, but you know, for commercial applications as well. So a, a perfect example, and as, as was pointed out earlier, uh, we, we need to speed the time from prototyping to uh, bringing solutions to market. I call it ideation to commercialization and five years or less. I think that is the opportunity we have as a country. And if we invest our dollars wisely, uh, but also just don't try to keep going down the same old paths, I think that's how we'll regain the leadership uh, that, that we need to have here in our country. I was hoping you'd say that since I got uh, this sent to me in the mail recently, this is your, uh, this is the carbon nanotube, uh, uh, you know, eight inch wafer. So it's uh, really fun to go from that conceptual idea a couple of years ago to actually like seeing this uh, manufactured. Uh, I haven't tested each of the chips. I can't tell you about yield, but uh, it is uh, fun to hang on my wall. So uh, great stuff there. Um, three. So about innovation, I want to ask you actually, where are you seeing innovation in funding models? Right. So if you look at the government and how they're viewing this, like we've had a pretty traditional way in which you fund universities, universities do, uh, uh, you know, early development cycles, then you've got uh, certain private uh, public partnerships and consortium that we funded, you've got Incutel, you've got some sort of unique ways that the government's looking at doing uh, venture type uh, funding. Uh, how are you, where are you seeing innovation? How do you see this uh, relationship between the government and the uh, industry uh, moving forward? I think, um... Certainly from a, from a commerce standpoint, you know, as we've been talking to the industry about this innovation pipeline and trying to understand where the gaps are, um, there are at least, I think, three gaps that seem to have emerged in the discussion. And you know, I'm sure there's more, um, but there's, there's one gap, I think, around this, this idea of having this, you know, this rapid prototyping, it's kind of shared facility for uh, mid to late stage prototyping, um, you know, kind of multi-wafer and low volume high mix runs, that sort of stuff. Where I think there's this kind of, you know, how do you, how do you create that infrastructure and how do you make sure there's open access for everybody to participate in that infrastructure to, uh, to bake their ideas. I think that's, that's one gap that, we've, that seems to be emerging. There's another gap I think on, I think this idea of, you know, there are, as you're saying, there's multiple US government programs that support R&D in microelectronics, you know, whether it's in the NSF, DOE, DARPA, um, you know, now DOD's got this microelectronics commons that they're thinking about through the, uh, that's in the chips legislation. 
um, how do you pull all those initiatives together into a pipeline, right? How do you kind of have this handoff as, as these projects mature from one TRL to another? Um, so I think that's the second gap that we're kind of seeing. And that's that's one that people have been looking at. Like, so, you know, is there a way for us to be able to create some kind of a demand signal, almost a pre-commercial demand signal kind of saying, look, let's look at the, let's do a net assessment of these projects coming in and let's figure out which ones uh, look to be promising that need you know, whether that's late stage acceleration or some kind of growth capital or whatever else, right? Like, can we figure out how to get that going? That's the second gap. And then I think the third gap is this broader, if you look forward over the next 10 years or so, and you say, okay, what are the system requirements? What are we trying to achieve in terms of the outcomes, whether it's energy efficiency or whatever else? Um, what's the infrastructure gaps? Whether that's in tooling or, you know, new architectures or anything of that sort, right? Where, where are we seeing gaps that need to be invested in. Uh, and I think that's the third piece where, you know, going back to this question of having a more open roadmap, just kind of trying to understand, okay, what are the different elements, the infrastructure that I seem to be missing that we should be investing in, which may then inform some of the early stage um, US government programs. I think those are at least three that we've been, that, that are on our radar. And that's kind of how we think about this innovation pipeline and how we support it. Hey, what about skill gap? Are you hearing uh, fr from you know a broad community about skill gap? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think we're seeing so we're seeing skill gaps across a number of places. So I think you know, um, and certainly this gets back to not just the R and D and innovation piece, but even on the manufacturing side. I mean, honestly, just basic, just you know, getting clean room architects, getting getting uh, you know high purity welder, that sort of stuff is, is already a gap. Um, and then we're seeing you know there's going to be gaps. As we start to make these big investments and these fabs start to come up, you know, getting folks who know how to do the tool installations, you know, that's going to be a challenge. And then, of course, once you get to the actual operations, you know, making sure, you know, folks who know how to maximize yield, folks who know how to kind of look for quality, all of that stuff, I think we're seeing, we're expecting gaps there too, right? So there's a range of these gaps. And I think, you know, one of the challenges that we have to think through is, uh, obviously, there are individual states and universities doing some great work. Um, but in terms of building a pipeline, do we need a more coordinated approach, right? So that you can actually sustain a strong demand signal to get folks to actually join up in these pipelines? Or is it enough to just have every state doing its own thing? That, I think that's kind of an open question out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... Um... That leads into kind of this next section I wanted to get into, which is government investment and accelerating this agenda. So um, when I was in the government, our, we had a fundamental calculus, and it was really from this, the view of the DOD. And so it's different than, I think, the, the Congress view, but it was, you know, the scale of things actually got it out of the reach of control slash even ability to participate for some of the DOD entities, the size of the design teams, the scale of the manufacturing. We definitely couldn't own, uh, you know, manufacturing and, uh, uh, but we had trouble doing designs at scale as well. And so the agenda that we set in ERI was all about lowering the barrier to where innovation could come from. Chips was about, you know, hoping to spur a chiplet revolution so you could actually add, you know, unique flavors without having to redesign the, the whole uh, system. We did an AI uh, for EDA to reduce the number of humans in, involved in that uh, loop. And then we you know, looked at how to inter innovate in the eight inch wafer space, things like the carbon nanotubes with Skywater. So if we look at um, that, I mean, first off, is that central tenant something people believe in, right? This is a world that bigger has been better, right? It, it was actually at the time, not intuitive to look at how do you, you know, fight the natural trend of scale and look for where you're going to innovate right, in a world to uh, that you know, favored scale. So anyone want to step in and, and have a, a comment on uh, whether you know, that is a, a belief that is actually held within industry or um, tell me how we did. <laughs> All right. I could uh, just uh, briefly start off, uh, Bill. I know I, I really applaud what uh, ERI and uh, uh, DARPA MTO sponsorship of MTR uh, of uh, ERI has done is really you know put more broadly on the industry, uh, you know some of the innovative approach uh, needed to keep scaling performance going forward, 
And I think you're seeing, um, you know, AMD, we took an early lead there, but we're seeing really across the industry that approach being adopted. And I just want to underscore a comment I made earlier. That's that's what's going to drive standards. I mean, ERA, ERI has actually started some of that dialogue on standards, uh, but it's going to take even stronger participation uh, of industry. Um, and industry is very good at this. When the need rises for uh, standardization gets to a point, uh, we do all come together. Um, you know, Chandra is an area in memory. In memory is what I'll say one of the earliest uh, leaders are getting a super strong uh, uh, participation on standards. Uh, and so we do we do need that, and and I'm starting to see that emerge now. But uh, short answer, yes, uh, it's uh, absolutely taking hold in the industry. Yeah, and this is Tom. I'll just add a couple of comments. I think you know what Mark said really resonates, and you know it kind of goes back to you know AMD is a great example of a company that thrives uh, through collaboration, and that then leads to more innovation. I think that's uh, what we're doing at Skywater, you know, collaborating with MIT, Sanford, others in the industry. And by using um, this moment in time, you know, with the chip spill, et cetera, to create a renewal and in innovation. And your, your comment about linking university, academia, coming up with a national uh, semiconductor uh, roadmap or microelectronics roadmap that then links the efforts that we have and we have collectively a lot of great efforts going on in this country uh, but they're not always pointed in the same direction and so if we can link what we do at the innovation uh, level create a rapid prototyping capability that's frankly one of the reasons skywater exists and then turn that into scaled manufacturing not only for wafer fabrication but uh, end to end value chain uh, we already have a strong equipment industry. We have a strong EDA uh, capability here in our country. Uh, and obviously a lot of the designs uh, that, that uh, populate the world come from this country. It's really a question of connecting the dots and, and driving things through uh, collaboration at the innovation level. So that innovation again leads to end state solutions, uh, many of which can be made here in the US. I'd love to comment, Bill. So first of all, um, we absolutely have to lower the barriers to design. And, you know, in, in semiconductor, there's a lot of consolidation that occurs and, and for very good reason, because these high end designs are quite complex and require scale. But we have to in, we have to enable all the innovators in this country. I, I imagine like a maker movement for chip design. I mean, how, how do we get to that? I think is really important. But I need to acknowledge what Bill did. You know, Bill put, spent a lot of time in the early rounds of ERI, not knocking on the door of commercial companies and saying, you need to kind of get involved in this initiative. And I know, you know, at least at Synopsys, we're like, go away, government programs are complicated, they're messy, you know, leave us alone. And his persistence drew us in. And I would say by engaging with government, you know, we've always in our industry been working with system companies and foundries, that's the nature of our business. But what we learned in, the, in engaging in these government programs is you have to bring a team. You know, you, you bring university partners, you bring other industry partners, and you collaborate to fix a problem, to address a problem that's bigger than any one company can do. And I'm excited about the potential in chips because I've heard from our colleagues in commerce, you know, they want teams to show up. They want systemic solutions to things. They want things to be not just, a, you know, spending government money, God forbid, but, you know, truly trying to advance the ball and drive um, innovation. So if we can accomplish that and reduce the, um, the barriers to design, I think we can unleash a whole bunch of innovation. Not easy to do, but I think it's an imperative for all of us on this call and in the industry. Yeah, and I think, Bill, this... this this point about reducing the, the minimum efficiency of scale, right? Kind of change. That's a good example of that first part that I'd outlined of like a okay, systemic transformation. So we're not playing the same game of, you know, who's got more subsidies to piss at the industry to be, sorry, pardon my language. Um, you know, where, where there is a different structure that emerges, I think would be, that's a good example. But, you know, I, I, I don't know, technically, I don't know if there are promising things out there. And that's part of this, this I think this innovation pipeline gap that we've kind of identified as we actually don't, we don't have a ready-made list of those things that have gone through a certain amount of proof of concept and are looking as, uh, they're looking to be promising ideas that you can immediately point to and say, yeah, yeah, I want to, I want to invest some money here on prototyping some of these things, right? I think, I think that's part of the, the gap that we need to try to close. 
you know, I think one of the things that uh, now as electrical engineers swimming around lots of software uh, engineers and products, right? There, there is a little bit of a difference in culture and that, you know, when the software world faces some of these challenges, they find the common underpinnings, create open source technologies and then differentiate on top of a common base. It is a, uh, it, that's a little bit unique from a hardware uh, perspective. I know there's some movements on ongoing, um, but in terms of collaboration, like what, um, you know, I go over to Mark and Chandra as, as large companies, you know, how do you view um, how to uh, view both open source, but then beyond open source, just consortiums and, and collaboration in a world where IP is so important? Yeah, let me make a quick comment, uh, Bill, on, on the innovation front, right? I mean, one of the things that we really have to look at is the speed of innovation, right? How quickly we can get to critical answers that we need to see in any, any of these topics, right? Mm -hmm. um, there, was, there was comments about standards, standards you know, that's, that's very critical, you know, and, and it takes time, right? You know, when you have to form a consensus with, uh, with a diverse set of people, in the industry, it, it takes time. But when we make uh, progress, right, progress, we have, historically we have seen in every area, right, that we can imagine. I mean, the speed at which we have to do things and really fail fast, right, really fail fast. Because as Sri mentioned, right, you know, when we have to collectively get together and say, okay, what are the most promising things that we have in the horizon, right, in all these different areas that we talk about? You know, whether it is uh, innovative designs, whether it is innovative material systems, you know, um, and, and, and new concept devices, how can we collectively, you know, lay, lay it all out and say, what is the most promising thing that we can focus on? Now, historically, you know, we have been in a very competitive world, right? I mean, we, we try to keep those things very close to heart, right? So we would say, well, in a panel like this, you know, can we openly talk about what are the most promising memory technologies? Well, I would not be at a liberty to tell that, right? But can we get to a point where we discuss this at a high level at least, right? I'll post a few things here. I don't want to distract the team too much into technical discussions here, but 2D materials are there, right? You know, in the 2D material space, what are the, what are the, what are the barriers right now to enter into it in a big manner, right? What is preventing us from getting there now? If we go list this down in a very pre-comparative manner, I absolutely think there are topics that will emerge out that we can collectively come up to solutions, come up with solutions. Now that is very needed. Now I give this example because you look at publications coming out of Korea today, okay? Just as an example, and even China, you see that happening, right? Among industries collaborating with universities, joining together in a pre-comparative manner and coming up with these short list and prioritization. That is very, very needed, uh, very much needed because we are going to have, you know, we talk about $55 billion, but that's nothing compared to, you know, what we need to do, right? Mm -hmm. So the, our funds are going to deplete very, very quickly. Now, if we are not smart about how we spend this and how we get, it, get at these, you know, big problems, you know, quickly, uh, we will face challenge. The other difficulty that I want to very briefly mention is every material that we talk about, right? I think Tom mentioned about carbon nanotubes. There will be opportunities to find niche areas, okay? Now, will that niche area stay as a niche area or is it gonna explode, right? You know, if you go back in history and you look at a germanium-based transistor that was first conceived, well, it was probably for a niche area for building hearing aids, right? Now it exploded on us, right? And where we are today is his history. Now, what are those gems that we have that we have, have the potential to explore on us? This is not clear, right? In the memory area, I can talk a lot about this, but this is going to be very critical for us going forward, I feel. Mark, uh, can you address the, uh, uh, you know, the collaboration aspect of uh, sure. how we move forward? Uh, there's a word I use, and maybe I overuse it, but there's for reasons, ecosystem. Uh, you know, to me, ecosystem is everything in our industry. That, that's how we solve big problems. Uh, in, in the end of the day, why is it do I say uh, open source wins or these collaborative effort uh, win? Is that they bring an ecosystem. They bring us all working together. I mean, uh, it, it's just fundamental uh, to be able to uh, keep 
uh, our industry on, on pace. And so uh, we are committed in AMD to open source. We do open source uh, our software stack, um, you know, and it, and it allows uh, a broad set of in innovation across a community. It builds a whole community uh, building solutions. It brings, uh, uh, it's very strong input we have from our uh, government partners and our university partners that they want that kind of open source solution uh, so that they can collaborate with us, get students working with us on bright ideas. Uh, and, and the same in terms of the, the, the solutions uh, that we put together in the industry. Um, I believe you need uh, you know, this, this innovation coming from different players coming together. You, of course, big companies are, you know, can create a, a very, very strong vertical. Uh, I had years at IBM. I had, uh, you know, time at Apple working on iPhone. These are vertical solutions in their, uh, in, in their heyday um, at, at IBM. Uh, certainly mainframes is a vertical solution, for instance. Uh, you know, the, the iPhone, iPad uh, is a vertical solution. And those, those play their part. They drive innovation and they, they have a point need. But when you want to bring innovation across a broad scale of solutions, of uh, point uses in the industry, uh, you must have an ecosystem. And we're absolutely committed to that. Uh, that's great. Okay, so we got a couple of questions. Um, I, we're not going to be able to get through all of them, and timing-wise. Um, we had a really robust, good discussion here. So um, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to address all of them. The one that seems to be coming up is, you know, what can academia do? I think everyone's asking, you know, how do, how do they participate and what can uh, they do? So kind of go through the round here and, and have a discussion on that. Deidre, will you, can you start that? Yes. Uh, crank out more engineers and crank out more researchers and uh, draw them, help draw them to our industry. Keep it simple. Okay. So following up that, like Thomas, so how do we do that? So like, got it. Um, I think we're all on board with uh, making semiconductors cool again, right? Like, and it is cool. And it's actually like the most innovative and interesting time to be in this area, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody outside of this panel believes that, right? So how, how do we do that? Thomas, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Again, great question. I think a, a good example is the scale program uh, championed by Purdue to get more uh, people that are comfortable, uh, you know, getting clearances uh, to go into the DOD. Uh, that's a way to get people excited about semiconductor manufacturing. You know, I personally uh, am, have made this a, a mission uh, that I'm on uh, to engage, uh, you know, different institutions, educational institutions about the importance of semiconductors. I was at Notre Dame last Friday presenting to their VLSI fabrication class talking about uh, the exciting world of semiconductor manufacturing and how critical it is for students to get excited uh, about, you know, making a career uh, in this space. I have a senior who is getting told, uh, a senior in high school is being told, you, you've got to go into computer science. Uh, that's, that's where the action is. And I think part of what we have to do, is, as you just alluded to, is make it cool to be in manufacturing, uh, be you know, make, make it exciting. And so, you know, I think uh, university programs like SCALE, getting a semiconductor uh, program like Purdue is doing, these are, these are transformational opportunities. And frankly, why do people get degrees? Because they want to get jobs at the end. Uh, but as Mark alluded to, uh, there's, a, there's a certain intensity about semiconductor manufacturing uh, and semiconductors in general that I think is a great a uh, place for people, you know, to build a career, and it's not just about designing chips. It's it's the intricate nature of manufacturing them. And if we have good manufacturing centered jobs here in the U.S., I think we're going to draw a lot of talent into it. But it's going to take really all of us working with academia to make people understand why semiconductors and semiconductor manufacturing is, uh, manufacturing is, you know, a, an important career endeavor. And we also have a strong point of view they want to share. Yep, absolutely. I'll just add a, one thing. I gave a lecture to some inner city co community college students in LA and cover your ears, Mark, but I showed them a picture of like the NVIDIA headquarters and also the Apple infinite loop. And I said, you know, these are cool places to work, first of all, from a design standpoint. And then, you know, I showed them the stats. I'm like, and you, you know, you're going to work hard, but you're going to make good money and build a career for and a, and a life for yourself. So I think we need to kind of appeal to folks heart and mind. Absolutely. No, point of view I would add is that 
it, we are at an inflection point and, and uh, how, how we pull this off and attract people uh, to this area and collaborate together, you know, will we'll, uh, indelibly affect our future and the ability for the U.S. to remain such a strong, innovative player. And, and, and Sri, again, no pressure, but I think with what you all are leading at Department of Commerce, uh, we'll really bring a spotlight on everything that we've discussed here today. So uh, all of us are highly incented to work with you and Secretary Raimondo and and, uh, make this uh, incredibly successful and impactful. So I wanna make a point on, you know, um, how the universities can help here. Um, I think a lot of very good comments on, you know, we need good researchers. We need interdisciplinarily trained students, right? We We cannot have students, you know, just silo focusing on one area. You know, ideally, the, the workforce is going to, you know, come out coming out of the university pool uh, going forward should be, you know, fairly diverse in terms of their understanding. But of course, the strength in one area is always helpful, right? But having that vertical scale to understand, you know, variety of different aspects is going to be very, very critical. I mentioned this many times in many forums. I think uh, we see the lack of that um, in the U.S. universities, unfortunately. But I think we need to encourage more of that. And programs like, you know, Purdue, for example having interdisciplinary programs is actually a fantastic place, right? And we have benefited a lot, right? By having excellent students coming out of Purdue, particularly. The other extreme that I wanna mention is what uh, kind of Sri mentioned, right? We need good welders, right? Think about it this way, right? If you're a welder, you know, working in an automotive plant in a garage, right? What money are you gonna be making? And the same welder, if you're trained in doing some high pressure welding for a high pressure anneal tool, in a manufacturing environment in a semiconductor company, how much money are you gonna be making? These are enormously high paying, paying jobs, right? Now we are losing out on this, right? We do not have people who are trained in unique skills like that. And I will go back to the EDA environment as well, right? You know, traditionally, if I remember, you know, even 20 years ago, people say, oh, you know, if you're a draftsman, you know, you can do some AutoCAD type of work. You could probably play around with layout. Not anymore, right? What type of skills do they need? Do they need a four-year degree? Probably not, right? They can very well do a two-year degree in a community college in a very specific area, vocational training, with some good collaboration with industry and really be absorbed in the industry to cater to those needs and make a lot of money, right? So I think top research universities like Purdue has a, have a unique opportunity to locally part- participate, locally collaborate with community colleges, where they can bring some of their expertise and talent, even maybe go teach in places like that, and then give them an opportunity to get a two-year degree, for example, in a very unique area to be absorbed by the industry, particularly when manufacturing flourishes in the US again. So I think that's one one point. So there is a diversity of need. So I don't want to underestimate the need at at the other end of the spectrum where we focus only on research. Research is important. We need that, innovation, all of that. But there's a lot of innovation that needs to be done in, you know, having good data scientists, people able to go use some of the CAD tools better, and unique skill sets that we need in, uh, in, in manufacturing as well. So I just want to make that point. All right. I think we are nearly out of time. I'll look at Mark. Um, I see he jumped on. I think we are actually three minutes over at this point. So uh, it's been a great discussion. We haven't got to all the questions, but I'm uh, really excited to have pulled this, uh, this team together. I think... Um, <clears throat> what I learned is like this is this, this is a very special moment in time. Uh, the decisions we make in the next, you know, even three months but to a year are going to, you know, have this inflection work or not. If the bill doesn't pass, I, I'm worried if the bill passes and we squander it away. I worry this is a jump into a new uh, a, a new world of government uh, influence on this that is a uh, um, has to spark this this level of innovation. So. Um, good luck to the panel in terms of uh, getting helping get this right as we as we move forward. Mark, uh, any uh, last words from you? Uh, no, I just want to thank you once again. Thank you, Bill, for moderating this, and thank you, Panel One. It was a really interesting discussion. You've given us a lot to think about. Uh, I'll remind uh, everyone in the audience that there are two more panels. We'll take an hour break now, and then there's a panel will start, the next panel will start at uh, one o'clock Eastern time, and then panel three will be at uh, two o'clock Eastern time. So thank you for getting us off to a great start and giving us uh, a lot to think about. And uh, I, I agree, we're at an inflection point. And uh, if we can, can 
convey this excitement and opportunity and the rapid innovation that's needed in microelectronics, that's really going to help us engage the student interest that we need. So, so thank you all. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. It's uh, one o'clock and we'd like to get started with panel two. Um, so uh, panel one gave us a lot to think about and, and mull over. And panel two will continue that discussion, focusing uh, more on the commercial sector. And we're delighted to have Teresa Mayer. Teresa is vice president for research and partnerships here at Purdue University. Uh, she's also an active semiconductor researcher, and we've been colleagues in, in that area for a long time. So Teresa, uh, we'll turn panel two over to you. Thanks, Mark. Um... I hope everybody had a, a, a great lunch and um, we uh, are looking forward to another exciting uh, panel discussion. Panel number two is focusing on workforce development challenges as well as proposed solutions for commercial applications. And this panel is bringing together four thought leaders from a number of dis different sectors uh, to address this very important topic. So I will introduce the panel uh, panelists quickly um, and then uh, begin with a overall framing and then turn the panel over for introductory comments uh, from each of the panelists. So this afternoon we have joining us Dr. Willie May, who is the Vice President for Research and Economic Development at Morgan State University, Dr. Charles Clancy, who is the Senior Vice President and General M Manager of MITRE Labs, Dr. Shankar Bansali, um, who is a director of the Division of Electrical Communications and Cyber Systems at the National Science Foundation, and Dr. Todd Yonkin, the president and CEO of the Semiconductor Research Corporation. And so again, I'd like to just kick panel two off by framing both the challenge and the opportunity, just to put everything in context with some real numbers um, so that uh, we can launch into a productive um, dialogue this afternoon. I think it's fair to say that across the board, talent um, in our country is our most important asset. And this panel is focusing on talent. Um, according to SEMI, the semiconductor industry had some 10,000 job openings that couldn't be filled fast enough. When the president of SEMI was asked, is there a shortage of people, yes or no? He answered, there is only one answer, yes, and it's big time. Um, Indeed lists over 11,500 job openings in semiconductor manufacturing. Similar searches in, for semiconductor design, Testing, packaging, and microelectronics yield 12,000, 5,000, 2,600, and 1,500 openings for a total of over 21,000 openings currently today. This is approximately twice the number of openings as reported last year. And I think as all of us have been following um, the news uh, over the past year, um, it's uh, clear that the semiconductor, semiconductor and packaging industry is expected to grow rapidly in the future. Projections are over 17% this year and more than 5% per year through 2025. And uh, depending on um, the outcome of acts like the CHIP Act, maybe these are underestimates. Um, given that the workforce is approximately a, uh, 275,000 people, that equates to an increased demand of about 50,000 this year and approximately 15,000 in subsequent years through 2025. So clearly, not all demands will be met through existing programs and graduates. And that would include all levels from certifications and credentials all the way to PhDs. The rapid growth in the semiconductor and packaging areas is outstripping the national talent pool. And then if we take that a step further and consider the many majors and people overlap in areas such as cybersecurity and AI, there is even greater pressure on this number one important talent source um, to supply the future of the semiconductor industry. 
So with that overall framing, what I'd like to do is turn this over for a brief um, just opening uh, from each of our panelists, starting with Dr. Willie May. And if you could just say a few words also um, uh, about your, your current position and background, that would be great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Willie E. May, Vice President for Research and Economic Development at Morgan State University in a future life, in my only future life, uh, past life rather. Uh, I was the Undersecretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology and the Director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. Uh, today, we are living in an age like no other. In this information age, silicon-based semiconductors have become the foundation of the world's information economy. The information age is booming and our ability to handle vast amounts of new information is dependent on the creativity of our scientists and engineers. In order to beat these new information challenges, we need to enhance the production of the next generation of hardware, of integrated circuit uh, and integrated circuit designers and developers of, of related novel packaging technologies. Despite the numerous innovations produced by the United States, by US scientists in these technology areas, <coughs> our country is currently, uh, we, well, I won't say how we're ranked, but we currently provide only 12% of the world's manufacturing capacity in semiconductors. The migration of semiconductor manufacturing away from this country, along with the associated research and jobs, is obviously cause for great concern for the US and our global competitiveness. The urgency of this issue is reflected in the, sem uh, in the uh, CHIPS legislation that is currently before our Congress. HBCUs and other minority serving institutions are poised to help address this challenge by producing the, helping to produce that is, the next generation of engineers, physicists, and computer scientists for, this, for the US semiconductor industry. Uh, HBCUs, uh, because uh, while HBCUs represent only 5% of the US college, college and university infrastructure, uh, we produce 25% of a bachelor's degrees for black students in uh, the fields of STEM. Uh, although one and, and one more than one third actually of blacks who receive PhDs in STEM actually got their undergraduate training at HBCU. So HBCUs and other MSIs have to be uh, part of this, the solution to this problem. And we can better engage uh, HBCUs and MSIs by enhancing and building new facilities for training students to work uh, in the semiconductor uh, clean man uh, room manufacturing technology areas by providing funds for new faculty and staff and updating the curricula to educate students in the semiconductor chip design and advanced manufacturing technologies uh, by developing collaborative graduate research partnerships to expose students to the latest ideas and technologies. These would go a very long way to helping us to achieve the diversity needed for uh, the semiconductor industry in this 21st century information economy to, to strive, uh, not only survive, but to thrive. That ends uh, my comments. Great, thank you so much, um, Willie. Next up, we have Dr. Charles Clancy. Great, thank you. Um, so my name is Charles Clancy, I'm Senior Vice President at, at the MITRE Corporation where I lead MITRE Labs. Um, so MITRE Labs is, um, is a, a large portion of, of the MITRE, so the MITRE Corporation operates federally funded research and development centers um, on behalf of the, the US government. Um, pretty much every corner of, uh, of the executive branch has uh, work ongoing with MITRE. 
Um, and I'm excited. I joined MITRE because I'm really excited about the, the broad view uh, that we have across really whole of government challenges. Um, a year ago, we launched a, a group called MITRE Labs, which is around half the technical staff of MITRE Corporation. Um, and it's really focused on really going from, from whole of government kinds of problems to whole of nation sorts of problems. Um, and we uh, find ourselves in the midst of many whole of nation problems uh, these days from, from pandemics to climate change and, and all sorts of other topics. Uh, but certainly in the area of, of critical and emerging technologies, semiconductors represents one of those key challenges. Um, and so it's one of the areas that, that we've invested internally um, and are working closely with our federal sponsors through the Federal Funded Research and Development Center Centers, uh, but also partnering with, with industry to try and identify um, uh, uh, opportunities and solutions. In fact, um, just two days ago, we released our, um, a report from uh, our semiconductor alliance that we established that uh, really lays out a vision for the um, National Semiconductor Technology Center, which is part of the uh, CHIPS Act that Teresa mentioned. Um, but before MITRE, I spent uh, I spent nine years as a, a professor in electrical and computer engineering at Virginia Tech, and before that was at the National Security Agency. Um, so I'm excited to join the panel today and, and talk more about some of these key issues. Thank you, Charles. And next, we will turn um, to a perspective uh, from NSA from Dr. Bansali. I am Shekhar Bansali. I'm the Division Director for Electrical Cyber and Communication Systems at NSF. And I come to NSF as an IPA. Uh, my home institution is Florida International University in Miami. And for those of you who don't know that institution, we are the largest producer of Hispanic engineers and the fifth largest producer of African-American engineers in the country. I think the fourth largest institution by enrollment. Coming back to NSF uh, and uh, what's happening in the space and semiconductors, uh, it has been front and center in our eyes. And we've had multiple workshops where we engage with industry, uh, with universities. Many of the speakers here and many of the participants uh, have participated in those workshops. And that's helping us guide and develop new programs. Uh, and the sense of what we heard today morning, uh, that the challenge that we have in front of us requires an integration of technology, innovation, and partnerships Right, and that is the name of a new NSF director that's gonna be launched sometime this year, TIP. Um, our director is, uh, is a firm believer that the only way to conquer these challenges at speed and scale is partnerships. So partnerships is gonna be critical and reimagining how we do things that we have done and to kind of keep a future in mind, I think that's, that's the need of the hour. And uh, we're working very aggressively towards it. Thank you, Shekhar. And last but not least, um, we will hear from Todd Yunkin from SRC. Thanks, Teresa. Um, yeah, for those of you that don't know me, I'm, I'm Dr. Todd Yunkin. I'm SRC's uh, new CEO as of last August. And, you know, I was really excited. Uh, I'm uh, only the third uh, CEO in SRC's 40 year history. And I'm, I'm uh, taking over an organization that's really a trusted advisor uh, for the global semiconductor industry. You know, we're, we have the benefit of being a, a not-for-profit consortium uh, that helps to organize and lead a vast network, uh, a, a public-private partnership that has 25 corporate sponsors, three government agencies, over 100 universities, 2,000 faculty and students, and 900 industrial liaisons. We've got a shared dedication to research, prototyping, and workforce development. Um, and we've invested over 2.2 billion in next-gen technology and people, creating over 700 patents and investing in almost 16,000 SRC research scholars that have included bachelors, masters, PhDs, and postdocs, and many of them boilermakers. Um, you know, in recent years, we've been pivoting our agenda to an SRC 2.0 to really steer technologists towards the seismic shifts and the goals that we've outlined in our 2030 Decadal Plan for Semiconductors, which was released with SIA late last year. And maybe um, it's important to say that since I've come on board, we've also made a broadening participation pledge and a commitment to sustainability so that we have a 10-year technology plan, a 10-year people plan that's more inclusive and a 10 year plan for how we make the semiconductor industry become increasingly eco benign. 
And as part of that pivot, you know, we've made in, uh, significant investments in Purdue with about 48 million since 2018 in really research that spans the full stack from new materials to devices, interconnects, uh, et cetera, that will fuel the next generation of 3D chips to heterogeneous integration for two and a half and 3D systems. And of course, new architectures based on strategies like probabilistic computing and neuromorphic computing. Um, and I, I think that's all great, but if we maintain our position, uh, if we want to maintain our position uh, as global thought leaders in the US, we've got to commit to collaborative, collaboratively investing in and both driving the hardware and the talented next generation workforce. And the part, the reason I really took this job is that the story that, uh, that I was in love with in 2000, I was a chemist and I wanted to race to the atomic length scale. You know, that was great and it worked for 20 years and I had a heck of a ride, but that faster, cheaper, smaller narrative is not winning over the hearts and minds of the next generation of innovators. And we can see that in the drop off in their interest in making this amazing semiconductor hardware. So I'm here to try to rebirth our narrative to that next generation and get us off this toxic, uh, faster, cheaper, harder, uh, smaller uh, uh, narrative that is not winning their hearts and minds. Happy to be on the panel. Well, thanks, Todd. That is the perfect uh, tie-in to the first question that I um, would uh, like to uh, ask the panel to address. And um, given the feedback that you just provided in terms of um, maybe our students are, are starting to look um, in other directions um, and, and have not been flocking to uh, pursue areas of focus in microelectronics and packaging. Um, the first question is, how can we win the hearts and minds of next generation innovators to pursue a career in microelectronics and advanced packaging technologies? And I thought it would be uh, great for Willie to kick us off. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would say uh, the way to reach uh, the younger generation is to make it real, so to speak, and make it cool. Uh, back when I had hair uh, and I was coming out of school, I thought uh, uh, coming from my background, uh, being the first of my family to uh, attend college, uh, being a analytical chemist would make all of my peers and my relatives think, I was doing something cool. Maybe that's not a motivation for everyone, but it certainly was for me and to a lot of my peers. We wanted to do something that we thought was cool, but also something that was part of a movement larger than we were. My first job was uh, at Oak Ridge working for the Atomic Energy Commission at that time. And that was perceived to be working on a problem of national interest. Uh, and again, I think many of us then, and I think kids now, uh, actually, we can appeal to a national pride that actually you're working on something that contributes to a solution to a problem that is important to our country. And finally, uh, most kids don't go to work, don't go to college, at least their parents don't send them to college to expand their minds intellectually. They want them to get a job. And certainly I think we uh, have to impress upon them that certainly manufacturing is cool uh, and uh, there are jobs and there will be increasing uh, sources for employment within the manufacturing regime, especially uh, next generation sem semiconductor manufacturing. And it won't just be the same thing. There's a lot of diversity and uh, uh, chances for people to apply their creative juices and make a living for themselves while really making a difference with this country. And I'm, I'm rambling and going on and on now, so I'll just end it with that. Yeah, thanks, Willie. I, I just would like to share that I've oftentimes struggled to explain uh, to the public the work uh, that I have done over the years, and I would expect the same uh, from, from those of you who work in this area. But uh, now with the um, the the chip shortage and supply chain problems. I said, it's now a, a, a common phrase among the public. And so my life got a lot easier. 
Um, but I want to open open it up to anybody else uh, on our panel who would like to um, just provide feedback. I think this is this really gets at the the, the crux of what we um, need to do, which is inspire uh, the next generation of students. But but beyond that, um, how do we uh, really tap uh, the concept of lifelong learning and bring uh, people from adjacent technologies? Um, into this this uh, rapidly growing field. So, anybody else who would like to add on? I'll just note that um, I think there's a lots of, a lot of different ways to help connect with uh, with students, um, and it doesn't always have to happen in the classroom, right? I think um, experiential learning can be a huge component here um, to help uh, students really get a sense of kind of what the technology is all about. Um, I'd also note that. Uh, um, as, as you point out, the, the chips, uh, the, the general, the supply chain challenges have made this more top of mind for people. Um, but I think there's also really the opportunity to tell the story about really the, the, the role that semiconductors play in underpinning all the technology around us, right? So if you want to go work in artificial intelligence or you want to go work in, uh, I don't know, 5G, right? There's uh, there's there's uh, semiconductors that underpin all of that, that need innovation and well, everything from, from design, development, fabrication, uh, and, and innovation on top of it of how you apply to those challenges. So um, I think it, it, those are some of the themes that would help uh, really reinforce the, the opportunity in the space and, and get, get people interested in it. You know, to, to echo what Charles is saying, uh, Willie said, uh, if, you, if you think about it in a different way, uh, we are, we're looking at a challenge inspiring the generations. But I think to a degree, the challenge lies with the, us, at least in the university, university side, the faculty. Because if I was to take some of the NSF flagship programs, for example, ERCs and STCs, right? They're like, or the new directorate uh, and uh, program they're gonna roll out, 50 to $100 million 10 year programs. The sense of those programs is generally trying to have a compelling idea or a vision that you sell uh, that excites people and then you have everything around it. So if we were to use that as a framework, in the last 10 years, uh, there hasn't been, a, I would say, semiconductor focused uh, STC or ERC that has been funded. I mean, every ERC and STC we fund has semiconductor. It's like the new BASF, right? I mean, if I bought the BASF line, uh, we don't make a lot of things you buy. We make everything you buy better. Uh, that's semiconductors today, right? But we've not been able to articulate, even to our own peers, uh, what is exciting and challenging. So I think the, the shorter uh, stop I would suggest would be uh, us recognizing the fact that we need to put some bigger programs together and tap into these programs and perhaps use these to transform the curriculum that kind of connects with the students, like Willie said. And, and maybe I will try to say uh, what I heard in all three, um, but I wanna talk to the students uh, if they're out there. And I wanna say it sort of three ways. The next industrial revolution will not happen without chips and without you working on chips. The second point is we need your ideas. The, the innovations that happen today are miraculous but they, we are at the end of our idea uh, thread. We need your ideas and we need your, uh, your creative breakthroughs in order to be successful in the years ahead. And the third is, and I think Willie kind of said this, you will have a prosperous, interesting career. I can guarantee your family will do well. You will not be bored. You will meet interesting people. It will take you all over the world. Um, you know, I've loved every moment of my career, but we need, we need more uh, of your ideas and your energy uh, to really reach the full potential of that next industrial revolution. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I'd like to kind of go back to the numbers that, you know, they're, they're really somewhat staggering when you, when you think of uh, the, the, the gap that we have across all different aspects of what we call microelectronics from design um, to the, the actual chip manufacturing to packaging. And as I think you've pointed out, many of the, uh, the, the programs within universities and at our community colleges um, have been scaled back over the last 10 to 15 years. 
And so just to flip that around, how do we scale at a national level? And that would be all the way from thinking about credentialing to PhDs. So Charles, I wonder if we could learn um, something from the NICE framework around cyber. Um, are there successful best practices that, that we could take away or if there are any um, other examples beyond NICE? Yeah, so I, I think we can take, there's a lot of experiences that the cybersecurity discipline has faced. Uh, massive skill shortages over the over the last decade. Um, if you go to cyberseek.org, for example, you can see that there are currently um, over 460,000 empty cybersecurity jobs in the United States. So the scale of the problem is about 20 times worse than that of the semiconductor industry today. Um, and, and I think both are on trajectories to continue to widen. So some of the things that we've done in the cybersecurity space really um, it could be could be examples of things that, if deployed early in the semiconductor space, may uh, may help um, uh, begin to drive progress. So first, um, there's the the National Initiative for Cybersecurity uh, Education, which was developed by NIST uh, or led by NIST, um, really an interagency team um, that sought to really identify the the, the types of jobs. Uh, that exist in the space, right? And we've talked about everything from design to, to working on the fabrication floor. There's a lot of different jobs in semiconductors and, and not all of them require a, a PhD. Uh, in fact, many of them don't, but uh, all of this kind of gets mu muddled together because we don't have a good taxonomy for really understanding what the different kinds of jobs are and what the sorts of skills are that might be necessary for them. And the NICE framework in cyber provides that taxonomy that is, is a starting point. Then there's, well, how do, we, how do we develop the curriculum at the universities that would help uh, be feeders into all of these different, um, uh, 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 different roles? Um, and so, uh, in, again, in cybersecurity, um, the National Security Agency and, and DHS have put together a Center of Academic Excellence program where um, they actually map out specific knowledge units that need to exist at different parts of your curriculum, either undergraduate or graduate. They even have a community college version as well. Um, and by developing um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, and providing um, course materials and sharing among universities, um, you can really help stand up um, more scalable programs across the country uh, that then are designed to map into uh, um, those, those career fields. And then on the recruitment side, getting students interested in pursuing this, right, there's a whole set of different scholarship programs uh, that sit on the front end to, to try and incentivize people to go through this. And um, so I would imagine there's a lot there that we could learn from. Now, I'll point out that, that it's some, only modestly successful, right? Without this, perhaps the problem will be much worse, but uh, the, the cyber skills gap continues to grow uh, year after year. Um, but again, it would at least be a starting point where we can begin to break the problem down and help understand what different parts of the educational ecosystem. And again, it doesn't have to be a PhD. It could be um, a vocational reskilling of, of, of people working in other industries as well. So there's, there's lots of different paths that, that you can break it down into. Well, wow, that's, um, I, I, was, I was going to ask if there's um, evidence to show it working, but I think the point that you made that we don't really know um, where, we, where we would be without it. Um, and we have started to move the needle, although the gap, gap remains large. Uh, I think that um, uh, Todd mentioned uh, the SCALE initiative. This is funded by um, the Department of Defense uh, that, is, that Purdue is leading together with over 15 other university partners that are geographically distributed across the country um, to really uh, target five different uh, core areas um, within that broad range. Um, where we're trying to do uh, de the development of, 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 the, de of the curriculum um, and track and follow assessment with uh, industry internships. So I think there's some starting points like scale. Um, additional universities have been involved in that, um, but certainly putting together a framework would be great. A, a, a more formalized framework that could be nationally adopted would be beneficial. I wonder if any of our other panelists have other um, ideas for how we can scale at a national level. You know, maybe the, it, to scale this at a national level, if you think of what has happened in semiconductor education broadly, 
beyond the fact that a lot of it's left the curriculum. Now there's kind of a divide. The, there are schools at the, at the apex who really lockstep in the industry, with the industry. And there's the rest of the 95% of the talent pool that comes into the country where the PN junction is still the classical PN junction on which no device works, right? So there's an increasing disconnect between, uh, I, I, that's just my opinion, that there's a disconnect between the curriculum and what colleges and community colleges are teaching and where the seat of the industry is. So uh, perhaps, and this is probably also lined up for the industry itself that, you know, it's a, your survival at stake. Maybe you'll have brand ambassadors or partners that come in and do guest lectures in a really aggressive manner across the country. Uh, we do it collectively, like Charles said, you know, nice. We could quite create a, maybe a name, um, National Alliance for Microelectronics Education, I don't know. But, but come together to a, showcase to the students, like Todd was saying, your life would be great, but there's no live example. Somebody's in your classroom and I wanna be him, right? Uh, so, so maybe just reimagine how we do this because we came, we are where we are because of what we do. So doing the same thing is not going to take us out of this. Uh, and this would require a massive participation from industry, I think, in learning role models, learning technology experts, uh, making sure the curriculum is kind of updated and refreshed, and ensuring the folks that who are going to teach this curriculum are appropriately skilled up uh, to ensure that the curriculum is delivered. Yeah, just uh, tagging on, I think we heard about um, probably the importance of experiential learning and Shekhar, you just mentioned the engagement of industry is going to be critically important. Um, probably not only industry, but many of our federal laboratories, as well as our, the engagement of our, our federal agencies. Um, Todd, I wonder if you could say a bit about how SRC is fostering um, even stronger relationships with industry, um, including uh, how... Uh, SRC can assist as we think about the scalability in terms of um, the use of internships that complement uh, the student's academic education. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time and effort to make sure that we're trying to bring academics and industry as close together as possible. And I think it's imperative in the semiconductor industry because emerging state of the art is poorly understood by academics at large. I'll be honest that I'm still, I've still not met anybody from industry that understands everything, you know, but uh, they have the advantage of teaming rather than uh, having the uh, food fight for individual uh, accomplishments and, uh, and, uh, and monetary stream. So when we look at exper experiential learning, we think of a couple different things. We try to use grand challenges and benchmarking to organize the work and, and essentially cross-pollinate the interests of different academics and industry uh, stakeholders onto a common discussion, a common reference frame. For example, TLAs are killing everyone. Everybody's got their own TLAs. Nobody speaks in English anymore. We don't ever get to the actual thing we're talking about. I still don't know what an ERC is. Um, and you know, we, we try to infuse uh, member resources in design, prototyping, compute access, education into the scope of work. So the academics are essentially working on things that the industry folks care about and that the students can get trained on and then be more ready for a job. Uh, we drive uh, close interactions for sample exchange, characterization, et cetera, through a liaison relationship but that often takes some time to develop a trust and understanding what is and what isn't possible on sort of a meaningful information cadence. Um, and I think, uh, you know, maybe uh, one of the things that folks aren't part of the SRC community don't know is that we spend time on industry webinars. We spend time communicating to our community about why things failed because society has completely forgotten to talk about failure. All we wanna do is get on the cover of a magazine, win the next big award and move on. And failure is the first step to success, especially in the semiconductor industry. Well, thanks, Todd. Um, Willie, if you could take it from the perspective of the university um, reaching out to industry, I 
think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in order for the universities to develop the necessary capacity they need to make an impact in providing students for the industry, uh, we need to have more effective partnerships between uh, industries and industry groups and the universities. And I think, as I said earlier, uh, that, need to, that needs to be inclusive. Uh, obviously, uh, the main universities that we've already been, always been tapping, but we have a national crisis now and we have to get more people in the game and interested in the game and being able to contribute. So I think it has to be not only the federal government who's investing in the solution to this problem, but I think the industry has to ad address this also. As a former director of NIST, uh, would you like to share any thoughts, for, you know, perhaps from the perspective of a federal lab? Well, I'll just mention one of the things I said about uh, the uh, the nice uh, the national initiative on cybersecurity education. At one of the NIST seminars, I told, uh, uh, and we in had invited a number of the students. I said uh, the national. Uh, initiative on cybersecurity uh, education is not only nice, but it's also essential. And mm -hmm. I would say that uh, this activity, if we could come up with a nice limerick like that, that might uh, be something that catches on and certainly kids would remember. Great. Um, Shankar, I think you could provide some perspective, you know, sitting with an NSF. Um, we're hearing about the new tech directorate, but even outside of the tech directorate, you mentioned the engineering research centers, the science and technology centers, but even going beyond their um, NSF, uh, you know, uh, the new NSF director is all about partnerships. Um, so I wonder if you could uh, share any uh, perspective of, of how we could leverage um, NSF and other federal agencies in terms of really driving the needle in terms of making this connection with industry and federal labs. You know, uh, I would probably go back to what we were saying in the first, the first session, right? We were having a lot of conversations uh, like they're having with the DOC and the interagency panels and within NSF on what's the right way forward, right? How do you ensure uh, setting of programs and incentivizing uh, systems and opportunities that there is a permanence to it? That you know, it's, they're not just tied to this incentive and the incentive or the initiation, the seed goes away and everything falls apart. So a lot of conversations have, are taking place on, on trying to see uh, what would be the method of getting foundry access back to the PIs, right? But then goes back to how deep is the talent pool that can draw on that access if we were to create it. And then it comes down to, okay, what do we have to do to create a much wider talent pool? Uh, so the, a phase that our director uses a lot is the missing millions. And the missing millions are in quote unquote, the missing universities, right? So a lot of our focus of late has been, if we create these programs, how do we ensure that they will be inclusive? And, and there could be two ways. I mean, do you create a program for inclusiveness or we create programs that are structured completely differently that ensure inclusiveness. So we have everything on the table, uh, lots of efforts going on to, to take our time, but get it right to ensure that there is a lasting impact. Great. I, 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 I was going to pivot to the fact that I think there's ample and growing evidence that diverse teams and in inclusive environments result in greater innovation and impact. So you were really touching on that. Again, I'm just coming back to Willie, um, and, and you shared some of this in your opening statement, the keys of uh, maybe dive a little bit deeper in how we might really be able to move the needle on broadening participation, um, you know, specifically in the microelectronics um, and packaging areas. Uh, can repeat the question, please. Oh, sorry. Um, just building off of Shankar's point, um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could uh, sh share some thoughts 
that go a bit beyond your opening statements about how we can move the needle on broadening participation in the semiconductor area and the and the and packaging. No, I, I, you know, I don't think it's rocket science here. I think let's just do it. I think, first of all, there has to be a commitment to do it. There have not been very many challenges that we've met in this country that if we had, uh, when we have shown our resolve, our sincere resolve, we haven't gotten it done. And if this is indeed a national problem, we need to first convince ourselves that this is indeed a national problem and we're all in. We're going to fix this problem. We are going to uh, have a larger tent. We are going to make everybody feel that they, they are valuable uh, and that they can provide solutions to the problems. And I'd like to echo what you just said, that uh, you know, it's nice to be diverse. It is socially the right thing to do. But in my view, it is good business to do this as we get greater input from a greater number of people, we end up uh, seeing possibilities that we never could imagine if we have a smaller tent. Thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to add to this really important point? I mean, the missing, missing millions, um, the impact on innovation, this is just such an important point. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll chime in and just to say that you know again it's it's a it's a business imperative to to really get the kind of in innovation we want. We need diversity of thought. We need to unleash the ideas beyond the top five universities. No offense, Purdue, but um, you know it it's it's about disseminating uh, that divide between industry and academics, sharing our time and knowledge so that. You know, it's a much deeper, uh, more educational relationship than just here's a check and a picture, you know, because uh, it's a requirement of some, some contract. We need to find those, those partnerships, extend those networks. And I, I am confident that once we do, the relationships will return, you know, hundredfold uh, on the investments and the energy and enthusiasm we get will be very visible uh, immediately. So, yeah, you know, I think to this end, we we all recognize, particularly as we want to have more experiential opportunities to to provide that kind of hands-on, minds-on training in so many of these areas, that the barrier to entry for many institutions, if we think about community colleges and and um, universities. Uh, that we need to uh, have participate in, in this, uh, basically closing this gap, the barrier to entry, particularly um, as we're looking at the exploration of hardware and manufacturing uh, by academics is very high. Um, do we have any ideas about how, how we can address this challenge? Um, because there, there probably isn't enough federal funding in order to close that gap. So do we have any creative, innovative ideas? Well, I mean, you could make it a stipulation as part of some of the significant CHIPS Act investment, right? If we're going to invest $52 billion in the U.S. semiconductor ecosystem as a country, and industry is going to co-invest at least that much alongside, um, you could imagine a set of incentives and, and, and requirements associated with those funds that uh, there be everything from experiential learning opportunities for for students uh, working in in uh, the industry that's benefiting from those investments to some amount of um, production capacity that could be uh, available to universities for, mm -hmm. um, uh, for for their own experiential learning. So I think there's a way you can you can begin to knit those together as as part of how we make some of these large investments. Yeah, so directly as part of the incentives that are that are being distributed to the companies um, in order to establish the manufacturing base. Um, to that end, uh, again, the CHIPS Act, we haven't talked about it that very much in this panel. It, it clearly recognizes the critical importance of talent, talent development. Um, you know, practically speaking, even if um, we do see the 52 billion or some fraction thereof um, from the CHIPS Act, it will be a little while 
um, and, and the gap is growing. What can we do now? What, what can we do in the next six months? Um, and then maybe the bigger question, what do we do if the CHIPS Act funding doesn't materialize? Kind of open that up to, to whoever would like to tackle it. Well, I'll say that, I mean, so first of all, the, the CHIPS Act itself was, was authorized as part of the NDAA. So the authorizing language is there and it's just a function of now funding it. So right now, of course, we're waiting on the emergency appropriation that would actually energize it. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that we can't um, uh, find other organic sources of funding for it. If, for example, the National Quantum Initiative um, did not have an, an appropriation that went along with it, mm -hmm. right? It, it was authorized, it was established. I mean, obviously it's a lot less money, um, but it uh, it got baked into the president's budget and uh, then got fully, fully brought in line. So um, I think regardless of whether there's an emergency appropriation or not, we're, we're going to have uh, some amount of, of, of investment from the federal government, uh, whether it's defense programs or it's commerce uh, in, in this area. But um, I think, again, in, even independent of that, uh, it would be great for, for industry to be able to, I mean, industry has a vested interest in, in the, the human capital supply chain uh, being there to fill the, the 21,000 jobs you mentioned earlier. <laughs> Um, and so uh, I, I could imagine uh, it would be in their best interest to figure out how to solve some of these issues. Yeah, ab absolutely. Hey, we, we have some really great questions coming in. And I think we have about five more minutes on the panel. So I'm gonna pivot um, and I, I'm gonna go to this uh, question. It's not just about engaging the students, it's also engaging the faculty at the organizations that are educating the missing millions. What do they need? Willie, well, Jankar, you want to take a? So, so a lot's needed, right? Uh, there's technology upskilling, there's infrastructure upskilling, and, and like was said earlier, there isn't enough money around, so there's networking, right? So you, you, we need to probably think in terms of, and, and the great thing about Chip Sack, Teresa, is that at least we got, it got us all of talking and coming to the same platform. So I think whether the money comes or not, if, if we lose this momentum, it's our loss. Right, mm -hmm. so so the community has to come together. Uh, the the federal agencies generally tend to respond, right? But the, it has to be led by the community. So the the institutions, the universities, the the colleges, uh, the industry, then I think need to form an alliance, come up with a framework. Um, Ch Charles shared a report that that's on the NSTC side, right? So, so if we had a framework of partnerships that seems sustainable, uh, where we go back to the idea of like, it's okay to share, right? It doesn't, not every curriculum has to be invented at every school, right? Uh, the nice framework where you can create a set of master curriculum, master experiences. Some of them can be low cost. Not everything has to be high cost and create that infrastructure. I think we could get there much faster than we think we can. There's an opportunity here. Really? Uh, you're on you. I also think that we need to uh, fundamentally look at the issue of tenure and probably look to it uh, allowing more consideration uh, for tenure based on more applied research and less fundamental research, if you will. So people who would make significant contributions in this area would be uh, given uh, as much credit as someone who does something more fundamental that might uh, lead to quote, a Nobel Prize, maybe not that, but certainly this is an issue of uh, national uh, importance. And I think we need to treat it that way. And also I think I would say sort of coming from uh, the political realm somewhat, that we need to let our uh, elected officials know that this is not an issue for us to be playing politics around. This is uh, of extreme importance to uh, the security of our country. And uh, regarding uh, passing the CHIPS Act or something like that, uh, let's find something else to play politics around. This is essential and uh, this, needs to, this needs to move forward. And maybe maybe towards that end, Teresa, you know, I think it's important to understand that industry can come together 
you know, I that's uh, every day of my life is uh, is bringing companies together and getting on the same page for shared initiatives. You know, they're looking for trust in their relationships, but they uh, they will go with speed wherever they need to for the technology future. They think. I think the thing that's important is that the governments, the nations around the world, can help to sort of tilt where that happens. Um, and so the U.S. government has a really great opportunity to make sure the U.S. remains at the forefront of this global thought leadership. But industry does not have ultimate patience. They will go elsewhere and they are being suited. So um, I think we, we need to have a sense of urgency and strike upon this opportunity. Uh, to that end, we have a question and comment that came in from Matt Kelly, the Chief Technologist and CTO of IPC, um, very much enjoying the panel. And he would like the panel to comment on advancements beyond semiconductor development and looking at the entire ecosystem, including IC substrates, OSAP, PCB fabrication, and the final hardware assembly. Um, Todd, would you be willing to kind of open the aperture a bit and provide some feedback? Uh, definitely. I mean, we've been investing in heterogeneous integration, trying to do what we can to make sure that America understands this is the essential frontier uh, for semiconductor and, and, and system innovation in the years ahead. We can't decommit from chip making and monolithic integration. We've got to keep that as a national treasure, but it's this, uh, this packaging frontier, heterogeneous integration that's uh, that's really the, the space we need to inspire. So I, I encourage folks to look out on the SRC website at the Decadal Plan. Uh, we worked with uh, thought leaders from industry and academics this summer to release a, a, a workshop recommendation on microelectronics and advanced packaging technologies. Um, that is a nice compliment to the uh, NSTC uh, document that Charles put into the um, into the comment link for the audience here. So I think between those two documents, you can really see a nice vision on how we might uh, reshore uh, that innovative front. So I know we've, we've hit 150, but if the panelists are okay, I think we, we have a couple more great questions. Um, so why don't we try to just squeeze a few more minutes out of this panel session? And uh, I'd like to go to Charles on this question, what role should the federal government play across the various agencies to incentivize workforce and education opportunities across the field? Um, well, I mean, I think, well, first of all, that we need a, an integrated strategy. I think um, a, a challenge I've observed over the last several years is that um, there are uh, these big, hard technology competitiveness challenges and a, a somewhat uh, fractured and disorganized response across different parts of government. I think I, I witnessed it very a lot in, in 5G, for example. And so um, there kind of needs to be somebody in charge and there needs to be a national strategy that everybody is executing against that's coordinated out, out of the White House. Um, and uh, otherwise, you'll have different parts of the executive branch pushing in different directions, uh, destructive interference. Uh, the goal is to have constructive interference uh, across the board. Um, so one, really a, a national strategy that's that's got leadership uh, from the White House and focus that can help organize across, um, specifically on the education front, right? There's a lot of different agencies that have a role to play in that, uh, from the Department of Education to NSF. Um, certainly in cybersecurity, we saw um, uh, uh, NIST and DHS and NSA get very involved, right? So I think you've got to look at the places where there's the technical expertise within the government as well that could be leveraged to help inform uh, the, 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 the education programs that we might roll out. Uh, again, there's lots of different options from um, ROTC-like programs to um, scholarship programs. Um, uh, one interesting question though is uh, many of the scholarship programs that, that have been done in the past involve some sort of service commitment back to the government. And I would wager that of those 22,000 jobs you cite, probably not very many of them are federal employees. So I think we might need to think a little bit differently about some of the scholarship incentives and to get that workforce where it needs to go, not just into the federal government. Yeah, and building on that, I think this uh, does need to be our, our last question, um, but it takes us back to experiential learning and internships. 
And, uh, you know, the, I think everybody really sees the value and importance of these opportunities to our students. Uh, the question is related to um, the gap between the numbers of students and the need of industry relative to the availability or number that industry appears to be opening up um, for the students to engage. Um, so I think I'm, Todd, I don't know if you would be in a position again representing many companies. Um, are there things that we can do uh, to work with our industry partners to um, kind of open up more opportunities? Are there ways that uh, you know, we could deploy some of those within the universities? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we, the, we work really hard at this. Uh, we set a goal for, I believe, getting 150 students into internships and, and hires with our, um, with our member companies. And we actually just uh, uh, told the board yesterday that we had achieved 172. So, you know, that, that doesn't put a dent in your 21,000. Uh, unfortunately, I'm trying to grow my students by uh, five to twenty x, um, but uh, in the means of our community, that's that's really uh, really good. You know, I think ultimately inspiring scientists and young innovators is really connecting them with people within the companies. Right? You guys have seen this in academic settings where you you bring folks in to talk about what they do and why they find their careers to be exciting. You know, you can unleash. Uh, a power that is uh, really second to none. So I think it's just uh, mapping those points of connection um, and doing it in ways that don't uh, ask a lot of very busy people's time to achieve a result. Um, and, and so create energy, uh, resource appropriately, and break down uh, the walls that uh, naturally separate us. But I think we better wrap up um, because the next panel, panel number three, is going to begin at two o'clock and we'd like to provide a short break. Um, but I think, again, one of the key takeaways is that um, the ongoing advocacy for all the groups that are represented here from industry um, to our federal laboratories, our FFRDCs, um, our agencies uh, is just is critically important to just make sure that we, um, you know, continue to underscore the importance of microelectronics. As many of our panelists said, it's at the heart of so many of the critical technologies and to inspire our workforce. Um, so we are um, going to summarize uh, the outcomes of the uh, this panel session. And I think many. Um, good concepts were, great concepts were presented. Um, so we will be sharing those back out. So once again, thanks to the panelists and thanks, thanks to the audience for uh, great questions. And Mark, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Teresa. And thank you, panel two, for a great discussion. You've certainly given us a lot to, to think about and mull over. Uh, we are going to take a very short break, uh, three minutes, and then we will we will uh, commence with panel three at two o'clock. Uh, welcome back, everybody. This is Mark Lundstrom again. So we've had uh, two great panel discussions, and we're ready to start our third discussion. And this one will focus uh, a bit more on the special needs for the microelectronics workforce in the defense-related electronics. And I'll keep the introduction of the uh, moderator short so we can save time for discussions. Our, our moderator is uh, Professor Steve Goodnick from Arizona State University. Uh, Steve has had a lot of roles over the years there. I think department chair and associate uh, dean of research and several other roles. Uh, he and I have been colleagues in semiconductor research for a long time. So uh, Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks for that introduction, Mark, and uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, moderate this panel on microelectronic workforce development for the defense and national security, and we have an outstanding uh, set of five panelists, which I'll introduce in a minute. Um, I just wanted to make a few uh, remarks at the beginning. Uh, first of all, to say that um, while I'm at Arizona State University, I'm actually on sabbatical leave at Sandia National Laboratories right now in Albuquerque, and um, 
these opportunities for faculty to go uh, and spend time at national laboratories, uh, defense laboratories and DOE laboratories, I think is one excellent opportunity for helping with the microelectronics workforce. Um, I have several students and former postdocs that actually employed at national labs and that's partly due to these interactions. The um, unique aspects of the uh, microelectronics for the defense and national security have to do with the fact that um, they are, as opposed to the commodity, commodity technologies that we've been talking about so far in terms of chip manufacture, uh, many of the needs are targeted technologies uh, for specific application niches. In particular, um, what's needed are secured and trusted manufacturing um, addressing um, cybersecurity needs because of trying to avoid things like uh, Trojan horses in the microprocessors and things like that. Um, and so the, there's a special needs in terms of just the security needs for uh, manufacturing, but then there's uh, particular special needs uh, within the defense uh, communities, such as microelectronics for harsh environments, uh, things like ionizing radiation, uh, electromagnetic interference, high temperatures operating in nuclear environments. These are all uh, special areas uh, which are much narrower niches than um, that of silicon CMOS processing. There's also a much broader material base. There's things uh, beyond silicon, including, uh, for example, three, five materials for uh, very high frequencies, um, communications, wide bad gap semiconductors for, for power applications, and a broad sets of materials um, that are associated with electromagnetics, communications, electromagnetic applications, and of course, um, being able to uh, uh, sustain um, interference. So often these technologies are so specific that they can't be provided by private industry because basically the customer base is a customer of one. And so these often have to be provided internally by uh, uh, national labs and other or trusted uh, foundries. And so these are some of the unique aspects of the microelectronics industry you know, for, for defense and national security. From the workforce development perspective, probably the most challenging aspect is the fact that um, most of the jobs require US citizenship, or at least the vast majority of jobs. And at the same time, uh, there's often a need for more advanced degrees because of the specialized nature of, of the work. And that's in the face of the fact that the, the workforce pool that's being produced by universities is increasingly international, particularly in graduate programs. And as, as we talked about in, in Teresa's panel, you know, an obvious way of increasing the workforce of domestic scientists and engineers, US citizens, is to basically address the inequalities of the representation of, for example, women and underrepresented minorities in our science and engineering programs. If we were able to actually mirror the uh, representation in these programs, the demographics of society as a whole, we would easily have twice the number of of qualified domestic students that would be qualified to work in the def defense, uh, uh, defense and security sector because of having the, the necessary citizenship requirements. So we hope that you know, this, uh, this will be addressed. And I, I should mention that um, uh, one thing that I'm engaged with is that I'm on the board of directors for the Inclusive Engineering Consortium which has received support from the National Science Foundation. This is a consortium of HBCUs, uh, Hispanic serving institutes and Native American institutions, which broadly are trying to pool the resources in order to partner with um, industry, with um, Research One universities and other entities um, in order to provide uh, a joint um, access to facilities and to, to students. And there's been a number of uh, workshops held over the last year. And most recently we had a, a workshop on uh, basically partnerships in different technology sectors. And uh, one of those uh, in particular focused on semiconductors and the needs for the semiconductor workforce. So I think there are, um, this is a good organization in order to partner with, for trying to address some of these issues. So I'd like to introduce our five panelists and then I'll let them make some uh, uh, brief remarks following that. The first panelist I'd like to introduce is Scott Frost, and he's from Analytics Service Incorporated, or ANSWER, where he's an industrial-based engineer. 
And basically Scott provides full-time support to the industrial base analysis and sustainment program called IBAS. And he leads and has lead responsibilities for IBAS's uh, programs uh, called the National Imperative for Industrial Skills Initiative. Our second panelist is also from ANSWER. That's Catherine Ortiz. And uh, she's the principal analyst for ANSWER, the president and founder of Defined Business Solutions, LLC. In Kay's role at ANSWER, she supports the Department of Defense IBAS program that I just mentioned within the Office of Industrial Policy and serves as the outreach lead for the National Imperative for Industrial Skills Initiative. And by the way, I'm giving very abbreviated, uh, abbreviated introductions to the panelists, but you can find their full bios on the uh, website. The third panelist is uh, Nathan Nolan, who's at Sandia Labs. And in his 10 years at Sandia, uh, Nathan has led research and development efforts for radiation hardening by design, advancing circuit modeling of radiation efforts and, for, and product engineering for high reliability, high consequence systems. He currently leads the Advanced Microsystems Radiation Effects Development, where he is responsible for trust and radiation hardness assurance of microsystems for national security applications. Our fourth panelist is also at uh, Sandia, Ronnie Kellum. And Ronnie is the program lead for the securing top ap academic research and talent at historically black colleges and universities, acronym START HBCU. And this pro uh, program is at Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque. And it's housed within the Chief uh, Research Office. The START HBC program is designed to increase Sandia's diversity pipeline by creating specific partnerships to increase research collaborations, expose students to the mission of Sandia, and increase Sandia's awareness of each HBCU's capabilities and area of expertise. Finally, our final panelist is Kara uh, Perry. And Kara is the Education and Workforce Development Co lead for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense Research and Engineering, which is a very large acronym, and OUSDRE, the Trusted and Assurance Microelectronics Program. She also serves as the Strategic Radiation Hardened Electronics Council Workforce Development Co-Lead. And so these are our five panelists who uh, uh, all bring unique uh, expertise and background to, to this panel on the uh, workforce needs for the defense and security industry in microelectronics. And I'm gonna start uh, with Scott and let Scott make some uh, brief remarks and then we'll go in the order that I've just presented. Scott? Steve, uh, Steve, thanks for the intro. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, and, and thanks to uh, the Purdue team for, uh, for hosting this uh, important uh, session today. Uh, as Steve said, I, I, I support the Industrial Based Analysis and Sustainment Program, part of the Industrial Policy Office, and that uh, office has a primary focus on in, uh, defense industrial base health and associated risks. Um, I, I, before I go farther, I should say I, I'm, I'm representing uh, Adele Ratcliffe, Ms. Adele Ratcliffe, who is and Kay is as well, the, uh, and, and Adele is the uh, director of the IBAS. Uh, program. She sends her regrets. She was dual uh, committed today, and uh, so I'm representing her as is is Kay. And uh, for some additional full full uh, truth and advertising, I I'm an Ohio State Buckeye who happens to be on a day off, and I'm traveling with my wife uh, in, by car from uh, Washington D.C. to Columbus, Ohio, for the uh, OSU Purdue game uh, tomorrow. So I hope you all don't hold that against me too much. Uh, but I'm stopped right now, hold up in a Panera Bread. They were nice enough to turn off the music and uh, allow me to uh, uh, do the conference from there. If it gets too noisy, let me know and I'll, and I'll mute in between my words. Um, so I won't belabor the problem. I'm sure that you spent uh, a fair amount of energy on that, uh, on, the, on the hyper competitive globalized uh, nature of, of the problem, the offshoring of our production capacity, the, the multi-decade uh, atrophy, if you will, of uh, not only our production capacity, but the decade, uh, decades long uh, uh, disconnect that's growing between society and the manufacturing uh, profession of which uh, microelectronics, of course, uh, it is a key part. And uh, of course, offshoring is, is a constant theme in, in the microelectronics uh, business. Um, 
So Deloitte does a recurring study, and they've recently put out uh, an assessment that uh, there's a requirement for about three and a half million uh, manufacturers in this country, but they're projecting by mid mid uh, decade uh, a shortfall uh, of about two million unfilled jobs. Uh, of, and so, and that's just the validated uh, manufacturing jobs, uh, not counting all the offshore capacity that we have. So. Uh, much more to talk about on the problem statement, but we won't we won't go there. Uh, we don't need to. Uh, but what that is driving is a essentially a recalibration of the Defense Department's view on how they should be marching into this space. And um, uh, we we traditionally have looked to the OEMs, looked to industry, looked at big academia, looked to the Department of Education and Labor and others to really solve any workforce problems. We're a paying customer. We're the largest buyer of acquired systems in the uh, federal uh, enterprise, uh, but we don't solve workforce problems or so we felt. But we are rec- we've recognized that this problem uh, has really grown beyond the risk tolerance and the capabilities of industry to solve alone. Uh, and the Defense Department as a, uh, a, big, as a major stakeholder and buyer uh, needs to uh, look at how we are sharing risk and helping to solve the problems. So this has led to, uh, within the IBAS office, what we're calling uh, uh, a new initiative called the National Imperative for Industrial Skills, where that's a very broad definition of what we mean by industrial skills. Uh, and um, th- what you have on the screen here, thanks, Christina, for uh, putting that up, is uh, kind of our, our iconic uh, graphic depiction of the what we call the industrial skills workforce development ecosystem model there's nothing complex about it that there's more of an elegance to it it's a common touch point that we feel that all major stakeholders in the workforce development pipelines and the workforce development training and education system can look at and recognize that it embodies certain principles there is a kind of a secret sauce to this uh but uh, uh you know, several of the principles uh, revolve around uh, not only uh, uh, public-private partnerships and the value of those, but rebalancing those partnerships and how risk is shared. Um, other principles uh, that really talk about focusing more on the interfaces in the model versus, say, the, the, the actual, say, community college or university that's producing students, but how are those relating to one another and perhaps this, the very center, the centroid of this diagram is uh, what we call common industry relevant, industry driven interchange activity. Uh, and because the microelectronics space is p- perhaps mostly focused on uh, the four year tracks, engineering and, uh, and design tracks, uh, uh, but uh, fear not, uh, it's a big part of this model. And we be- believe that there's a continued blending of, uh, of, of of the interest uh, in the center of this diagram where for perhaps there's a there's a more diffuse boundary between uh, the, te- the 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 shop floor uh, the factory floor skills even in microelectronics and say the design and and, and engineering tracks so uh, uh, there are other principles uh, that uh, are behind this model but uh, t- in the in the uh, t- as courtesy to everybody else I'll I'll shorten it with, with that and, and won't go into it any, any deeper, except to say that over the last couple of years, we've invested about uh, $80 million uh, in prototyping uh, uh, best practices um, uh, across this, this space. And uh, Congress has really recognized the value. And a lot of that is congressional uh, added to a very small IBAS program, which is about a core of a t- $10 million a year. So, but we've been added uh, over a hundred million dollars in the last couple of years. And, and so we're, we're, we're working to put more and more of that into our, into our actual program. Uh, so Congress recognizes the problem as well. Initiatives like scale uh, are, are perfectly aligned with this model. Uh, and so we look forward to future, uh, you know, uh, partnering and teaming with, with Kara and, and, and her team and Peter and, and, uh, uh, and others, uh, other activities like that. One other principle that's important, then I'll get off the stage, and that is there, we recognize that there's, there's also a primacy of local 
uh, uniqueness of each problem. Yet in the microelectronics business, we also recognize the importance of a national integrated effort. And it's a blend of those two, you know, focusing on what are the local challenges and regional challenges, but also recognizing the need for a national effort. So with that, I will uh, I'll hand it back over to you, Steve. Thanks, Scott. So the next panelist is Catherine Ortiz. It's okay, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. Thanks to Purdue University for the opportunity to speak at this workshop. It has been an amazing conversation today. And I thank you, Steve, for moderating this panel. Scott gave some good background on the IBRAS program and on the National Imperative for Industrial Skills Initiative my remarks are going to really focus on three activities that we have underway, three of the projects that we've invested in that connect to the broader microelectronics workforce challenges. So as Scott explained, the national imperative ecosystem talks about both the, the four year degreed education path and beyond, as well as the shorter career technical or CTE path usually offered by community colleges and other specialized training entities. As was mentioned in the first panel and again in the second panel, electronics technicians and operators are essential to the macroelectronics ecosystem and they are in great demand along with the engineers and the scientists that are going through the four year degree path. So at IBAS, we have deliberately decided to invest in developing an electronics technician workforce, um, focusing more on the shop floor. And I'm going to highlight three efforts that can provide a good connection to scale and the microelectronics engineering efforts that others have talked about today. The first project I wanna highlight is at Vermont Technical Manufacturing Collaborative. This project supports the development of Advanced Manufacturing Center at Vermont Technical College, VTC. They offer training in traditional manufacturing skills like welding and machining, but they're also developing a comprehensive education path for electronic technicians and operators. We've also, as a second project invested in developing a new category of workers called the system engineering technicians. This is through Auburn University's system engineering technology or SET project. The SET project is using, is producing technicians who can use the model based um, techniques, tools, who can do the time consuming work of capturing system designs using modeling software, integrating digital tools and managing all the associated data to free up the engineers from some of those more time consuming and tedious tasks. Finally, we have invested in another, a small effort that began as a way to address the shortage of printed circuit board technicians. It's our electronics manufacturing technician education project it's a three-way collaboration between Aeromark, Michi Michigan Technological University, and Calumet Electronics. Under this project, individual universities team with an industry partner to develop workers for its hard-to-fill electronics manufacturing positions. Scott and I will be happy to give you more information about these projects offline, but I wanted to highlight just some of the ways that we are looking at the Department of Defense to fill some of these gaps, to build this talent pipeline and ways that we could collaborate with SCALE and its partner. We look forward to further discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Well, I'll turn to our third panelist and that's Nathan uh, Nolan. Uh, Nathan, it's all yours. Yes. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, so yes, I, I work at Sandia National Laboratories. I am a hiring manager. I am in the thick of the trenches right now trying to find people to come work at a national laboratory to do government work. And so, you know, I'm competing against 21,000 other job opportunities that you heard in the last panel, 
trying to encourage people to, why should you consider a career in US government or working for US government problems? And, you know, Sandia is kind of in a unique place because we are a, we are a national laboratory. We have some name recognition, unlike some other perhaps uh, government laboratories. Um, we do get out and publish and, and have, have uh, pretty active uh, interactions with a lot of uh, university partners, a lot of uh, other labs and, and industries across the nation. Uh, but still, it's hard to entice people to want to apply and come to, to, come to these kinds of jobs. Um, we, we, are, we do have some uniqueness in the fact that uh, we, we kind of sit at a place in, in, I work for the MESA facility, which is the name that we give to our microsystems engineering facility, where we actually manufacture silicon and gallium arsenide and compound semiconductor chips for the National Nuclear uh, Security Agency. And so we have sort of a captive uh, supply chain, a captive um, uh, integrated device manufacturing from the ground up. We have, we have the, the fab technicians, we have the process engineers, we have the device engineers, we have the layout engineers, we have the reliability engineers, we have the material scientists and we have the physicists. And we have all of these things integrated together because at least at some, in some instances, our nation has always recognized the fact that, that yes, we need to have an assured supply of the most critical elements for our most critical systems. And so Sandia fits in a nice place where we, we supply that. Um, and it provides a, a set of unique challenges for us as well. We're not making the three nanometer chips. We research in the three nanometer chips, but we're not making them. And that, that makes it less attractive to students when you tell them, well, we're still working in 350 nanometer technologies. <laughs> that was before they were born. <laughs> um, but it provides a, a unique set of opportunities because it has to be extremely reliable and extremely um, hard in these extreme environments, as you say. The, one of the sayings that we like to share around Sandia that, that helps give the sense of the mission to, to people is that we have this concept of always, never. Our systems must always work when they are needed and never at any other time. So that comes with a huge set of challenges for trust, for security, for safety, for reliability, for, for guarantees that these things work in environments that we cannot create. Um, and so how do you do that? It takes a lot of deep understanding of the physics and every piece that goes into this from the atoms up to the systems and there are huge challenges in, in taking effects and phenomena that occur at the physical level and understanding how that's gonna impact you at a system level. Is this thing going to work or not in whatever environment I put it in? And so there's, there's, a, there's a, just a vast array of scientific and technical challenges that, that are frankly unknown to, to many students because they don't see that aspect of government, that they don't see that aspect of national security. We use nuclear weapons every day to keep this nation safe, but it's not the Googles and it's not the Facebooks. It's not the things that are in front of the students day in and day out, moment by moment, when they pick up their cell phone and start Googling something. Um, and so it's not forefront in their mind. And yet it comes with this huge array of interesting and great challenges that, that it frankly inspire me and many of us at Sandia to dig into the why and what's, what's really going on here. Because again, we can't just do a pass fail test and say, oh, we're good because we don't have that pass fail test. We have to understand and be able to extrapolate. And so we need that deep understanding. And so having students that have that kind of passion that, that want to know what's going on at the very fundamental levels and be, then be able to apply it all the way up at the system level and work with, with teams of people all from, from all of those various disciplines to make the system work. You know, the other cool thing about what we do and, and a message that needs to get to students is, is you know, there's software that we do, but there's hardware as well. And the cool thing about it is that, that we fly what we build, right? And so it's cool to see something that you build get flown and work in actual real environments. And so, um, you know, we, 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 have, we have a lot of work in front of us and, and we, are, we are working hard to try to reinvigorate our engagements with universities and, and the industries and strengthen and grow and build our intern programs and our research portfolios to make sure that, that, that we are getting students excited about the things that we are doing early on in their careers and then they're interested and, and willing and able to commit. Uh, one last point I'll make is 
is the need again for, you know, because it's a national security application, we do need US students, students who can get clearances. We, we, we typically look for people who, you know, we, it, it helps us to have people who are willing to make long-term career commitments. Um, the, the model of people moving around every three to five years that you might find in industry really is difficult for a, a national securities lab that has to maintain systems over 30 years. And, you know, the system that you started building 30 years ago, you might need to still be working on today. And so having some longevity and some overlap from old, um, the, the more experienced folks to the, to the newer folks coming in is critical and key for us. And I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, Nathan. So our next uh, panelist is also from Sandia and that's Ronnie Kellum. Uh, Ronnie, it's all yours. Hello, Stephen, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect, thank you so much for having me. Um, so. Uh, I agree with everything that Nathan said, you know, also being a Sandian, so I won't um, belabor a lot of those points, but from my perspective, being inside the chief research office where we build a lot of relationships with universities, particularly underneath our academic program structure, um, we, we have the need for students. But the unique piece is that although we're like other government agencies, we're not a funding agency. And so we have to rely heavily on building relationships, building relationships with the universities, building relationships with the students, building relationships between universities so that we can identify the unique capabilities that those universities have so that we can work together and that the universities can work together. Um, I particularly um, work with historically black colleges and they're heavily relationship based, right? Those students have never heard of Sandia. Um, we're, not on, we're not on Google. We're not, you know, putting out commercials for them to see. So the cool work that um, Nathan was mentioning is happening, but they don't know about it. And so in order for them to become abreast to what does the national security space look like? What are we, are, what are we doing in that space? What, what, it, what is super important? If you can think it and attach national security to, to it, Sandy is probably doing it, but, they, but, but they're not aware. And so we want to make sure that we start to build those relationships by influencing curriculum, exposing them to the work that we're doing, um, getting them to know our, our scientists and engineers, um, and really putting our, our best foot forward to make institutional commitments to these institutions. Um, we also recognize that um, there's a heavy undergraduate population at some of these minority institutions and the graduate population is not always as large. And so leveraging our other university partners such as Purdue University um, and some of the other institutions that we have relations with, to, relationships with, excuse me, to start to build that pipeline to where they can see Sandia on the other side and that Sandia can help coax them through the undergraduate experience as we're influencing their curriculum. The graduate experience as if they decide to go to a university that we all Already have a relationship with, we can still continue to talk to them about the importance and the value of the national security space, um, the microelectronic space, or whatever technical space that we feel is imperative to our mission. We want to make sure that we're embedding that early and often. And so Sandia has a lot of challenges with, you know, being an FFRDC um, and, and, and having some barriers to, to how we do that. And so looking at the unique ways that we can um, influence students and influence universities and, and be embedded in universities so that we can start to change the way that change and influence the way the pipeline actually looks. Um, so I, I will stop there. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Our last yeah. panelist is uh, Kara Perry and um, I'll turn it over to you, Kara. Thanks, and I'll keep my comments short. Um, You've heard a lot about today, uh, several people have mentioned scale throughout all the discussions. And as part of the uh, Trusted and Assured Microelectronics Education Workforce Development Technical Area, I am the program manager um, of scale and I lead the government oversight committee. So scale, I'll just give you a short description. It's a unique workforce development effort and we have created a public-private academic partnership, and that really is the key to this. So we, we one of the, <clears throat> the key things is we gather input from the stakeholders. And <clears throat> excuse me, by stakeholders, I don't mean just government agencies, and of course we include those: DoD, DOE, NASA, MDA, etc. 
But we also included defense industrial based companies. And we heard from a lot of those companies, uh, several of those companies earlier today. And I think it's important that this effort be a combination of, of the two government agencies and the um, private sector working together. The university consortium is led by Purdue. And what it does is it takes the needs of the stakeholders, as I said, um, we gather that information from them. And then they convert that into training the students so that they have the skills that the stakeholders need in their workforce. And um, as Nathan mentioned, they need US citizens. And this is a common thread, right? So all students associated with scale are required to be US citizens. And so there's a, a lot of things that um, have been mentioned earlier today as far as uh, uh, things that we want to see in, in workforce development that SCALE is already doing. So it's, it's a, nice to hear that we seem to be on the right track. Um, we've had great success so far. And while it is a great first step in the right direction, um, we also need to make sure that we are trying to bring in um, <clears throat> students at an earlier age. We need to make sure that uh, middle school and high school students hear about microelectronics and that that is something that they can learn about further when they go to an undergraduate school. And in addition to that, once you get the students hired, you need to make sure that they're get, getting um, continuing education and uh, perpetually upskilling the existing workforce. So I'll stop there. Um, I'm looking forward to the uh, panel today, thanks. Thanks, Kerry, and thank to all the panelists for that uh, great overview of the needs and uh, issues in the defense and security industry. I'd like to start by maybe it's been talked about already, but um, and we've already talked about the the problems of uh, citizenship, of course. But um, even for U.S. students, what do you consider the greatest challenges in attracting U.S. students? to the microelectronics uh, for defense and national security uh, sector. Anybody wants to chime in or if not, I'll call on you. Well, I'll, so I'll go, is, ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> this is Kara. I'll, I'll just briefly say that uh, one of the largest challenges, there, there's two that I see. The first one being that um, as Ronnie said earlier, students just don't realize that this is a career path that they can take, that, that microelectronics is something that they can go into. Um, that's the first challenge. And um, I think the, the second challenge is um, bringing in the US citizens, you know, especially when you're talking about um, graduate students in microelectronics, Mo majority of them are foreign nationals. And I think that if we're able to get more students into the undergraduate degrees and get them graduated, then that will help us uh, solve the graduate student problem of US citizens. Yeah, Kara, thank you. I'll just amplify that. I, I mean, I, you, you sort of hit on one of the things that I made in my opening remarks was that they're just not aware of the kind of work and the, and the opportunities that exist there. Um, I think also that, that, that we have a really big challenge in competing with some of the big tech things for name recognition, for, for, for the glamour and glitz that seems to go with it. Um, and frankly, as, as you know, government employees, we, we often are challenged to meet the salary and benefits that they can get in industry. And so it takes somebody who has a real commitment to the mission and a real passion for the work. And, and where we offer the advantage, I'll say, over industry, as far as my perspective is, is especially in a group like mine, is you have the opportunity to interact with people at every level of the organization in every venue of, of technical uh, activity. And you're not siloed and you're an etch engineer or you're a photolithography engineer or you're a test engineer, but you work across all of it. And, and so that, that provides a lot of stimulus and, and, and innovation for, for the, the students and the people who are able to work in those environments. Any other comments from the panelists? I'll just jump in here, Steve, with a, 
uh, tagging on to what Kara and Nathan said about the lack of awareness. And if you take that down to the technician level, I, I think there is a, a broad misunderstanding of what education level is needed to work in the microelectronics or semiconductor industry. And if you look at the, the two year um, technical path through the community colleges, people are able to work and contribute in semiconductor industry, even with just a two year degree. And I think we can build excitement around that area for the people for whom a four year degree is just out of their reach. I'll, I'll add to that. I agree sure. that, that, that technologists and, and folks with two year degrees are absolutely essential to what we do. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is absolutely essential to what I do in particular as well, right? I have to have some PhDs who understand the deep physics and, and, the, and, the, and the modeling and, and the connections to circuits, circuit design and the whole integration picture. And so it takes a, a number of years to develop that skill set too. But you're right, it, it covers all the whole spectrum really is, is, is what we're looking for. Well, this, this brings up the issue of the pipeline because it was mentioned, you know, we have to increase the pipeline and, and wondering if you can share maybe what the best approaches would be to increase in particularly the number and diversity of U.S. students coming in to pipeline, which may, you know, means starting, you know, even preschool and I, I mean, high school and, and so forth. If you could share maybe best practices or, you know, what are some uh, approaches that would help us increase that pipeline? I, I think um, one of the biggest best practices um, or, or philosophies, I would say, is that students have to be able to see themselves doing something, right? You know, and if mm -hmm. they can't see it and they can't envision it and they haven't, you know, seen someone that, that looks like them or comes from where they come from, it's hard for them to envision that that's what they're going to be doing six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years from now. And so I think making sure that when we, we when we talk about pipeline, that we're giving students the opportunity to see themselves in that work, you know, at whatever level that means. So if it's in high school, you know, exposing students to um, the different types of things they can do at that level. You know, once we get to the undergraduate level, it's exposing them to whether it's internships, whether it's just people coming on their campus to talk about the work that they're doing. So that that continuous exposure allows them to say, I, I think I can do that. I think that that's something that one, I might be interested in, but also it's achievable, right? There has to be um, the willingness for the student to, to understand that that's something that they can do and it's tangible for them. And so, you know, as we talk about, you know, different pipeline activities, making sure the student can see themselves all the way through is super imperative. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good point. Does the IBAS uh, project have any sort of outreach uh, recruitment strategies for trying to get, you know, especially into these two-year degrees, how to, to recruit students out of high school. You're muted, Scott. I'm not, can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Uh, well, first of all, it's a simple math problem in, in, in a numbers game that and it's not in our favor. You know, the growing gap uh, between supply and 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 demand that, that we're facing. But the other thing that is important is to recognize the sensitivity of the decision points in a person's life, uh, and the importance of perhaps pushing the uh, pushing the uh, focus area to the left a bit uh, on a time scale. And we're, we're seeing that the uh, the middle school uh, uh, point in a person's life is where we really have to start working that a lot harder. Uh, uh, it, because if, if you're starting to push the, the messages in high school, it, it's often too late. Uh, perhaps not so much in microelectronics, but in a lot of the, uh, the two-year tracks, uh, middle school is, is becoming more and more of a, of a prominent point that we need to work. So um, I would just, I would point to that. And of course, even earlier, uh, start getting the, this very limited population, this shrinking population of supply, domestic supply of, of students, 
start working them earlier in their life uh, and, and perhaps working the influencers, the parents and, and, and the others. So that's what I would say. Okay. Another question I wanted to ask was, uh, this has to do with, you know, what are the key differences uh, between the microelectronics need in the defense sector versus the commercial industry? And how does that impact skills needed for you know, working in the defense and security industry? I, I wanna uh, piggyback on some of Nathan's comments. One, I think there's a, a real advantage in the, the, the excitement of being able to work across the entire portfolio of microelectronics when you're in defense, you're not limited, you're not siloed. You, you have the opportunity to work a very broad, wide aperture set of challenges, and that's exciting. But also uh, just the fact that you very directly can serve your nation and national security and economic security, you can, we can play that uh, hard because it's the truth. And I think uh, that, that plays on, on uh, another motivation that uh, behind, you know, uh, getting someone to decide to come into this path uh, in the first place. So uh, those are puts that I would make. I'll add that, uh, th th I mean, that's, that's very good. And, and I'll kind of piggyback on the question from last time is those things that we could be doing. Um, I think what, what scale is providing an opportunity for is very, very good. It's, and I've, I've taken advantage of it a few times is, is the ability to get passionate researchers, passionate engineers from this community in front of students and, and help them see themselves in this role, help them um, recognize the, the magnitude of the challenges and the excitement that, that is there and com communicate that, that, that national patriotic pride that, that, that many of us feel, you know, day by day, that's what gets us up in the morning is we know we're serving our nation and that what we do today matters to the security and safety of, of our people and our country. And that, that's, that's a powerful thing for many of us that are in this area. Um, yeah, I've, I've worked in industry and I've worked in, in, in government and I've worked at, you know, government contractors in my career. The industry, I, you know, I confess was a very, very fun time because we were very busy. There's a lot of activity going on. You're, you're, you're producing stuff, producing a lot of stuff, and you're living in a very data-rich environment. Um, but industry comes with some challenges as well. And the fact that, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of up and down the, 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 the there's, there's years that are really good and years that are not so good. And so you're hiring people and then you're not hiring people or laying them off. One of the advantages that, that some place like Sandia or many of the government agencies offer is there's a lot more stability in, in our field and in our area that we're not going to have a lot of this up and down turn that, that the industry goes through. And so there's, there's a lot of stability. You know that you, know, you can have a 30-year career if you want it. You can stick around and you're going to be doing you know, exciting things. I like to say that, that, that uh, every time we turn on a radiation beam and put a part in it, we learn something. You, you think you might know what's going to happen, but as soon as you turn on the beam, no test plan survives contact with the first beam. <laughs> um, we're always learning something, and, and it's exciting in that regard, too. Great. Thanks. Yeah, that job security is, is definitely an advantage at, uh, in, in the national labs, and I think that is an attractor for students who want to have a stable career. Um, we're getting towards the end of our time, so I'd like to ask about continuing education. I'm wondering what are the needs in the uh, defense industry and government sectors in terms of continuing education and upskilling for employees? Is that an active area um, within you know, DOD labs in Sandia, for example? So yes and no, I mean, we, we <laughs> We, you know, because we tend to hire a lot of PhDs, there's, there's, seems to be less opportunity for continuing education in the case. I mean, we, we do encourage and promote a lot of um, short courses and conference attendance and making sure that you're presenting at conferences and building your, your, your creds and your, your, your knowledge base that way. Um, Sandia offers some limited opportunities for, you know, um, students without the PhD to go get a master's degree, for example. Um, but those, those have tended to be very highly competitive and, and challenging to get into. 
Um, certainly, you know, we offer tuition assistance and things of that nature, and that's, that's key to what we do. Um, we have a very active postdoctoral program. Um, so a lot of the people that we hire into Sandia ultimately come through our postdoctoral program where we, we hire the postdocs as postdocs. They have two to three years to work on a very focused, specific research program, uh, get some publications, get some name recognition, build that program. And, and then, uh, and then if, if they're successful at that, then they usually have an opportunity to then become staff members and, and full-time employees of the labs. So I'll add to I'd that. Like, I, oh, go ahead, Karen. Go, it, my, my comment's pretty quick. I think that this is actually something that the government in general needs to improve on. I think that it's, it's key to keeping um, employees in those positions and not going back um, to other, other industry. Uh, you have to keep training them. You have to keep letting them grow or, or you're not going to be able to keep them. And I think it's definitely something we have to improve on. We're almost out of time, but let me um, pick a question from um, that's been posed to the panelists. Um, this is, are there any organizations students can join as members that might be, you know, related to or give them more knowledge about you know, the defense and government sector, other than things like IEEE, et cetera. Yeah, I was going to say IEEE, but that one's kind of an obvious given. Um, yeah. Certainly there, there, are, there are a handful of uh, conferences that, uh, that a lot of our work is presented at. So me specifically, you know, I work in radiation effects. There's a, there's a very good conference for the nuclear and space radiation effects that's, that's open. Um, gets you a nice introduction to the community. Um, a lot of academic researchers present there, a lot of government researchers present there, um, and it's a nice way to, to build that relationship. Um, they provide good short course material um, and poster opportunities, and um, other conferences like that I think would be really good opportunities for, for students to to see what's going on. And, and, you know, frankly, COVID has kind of been a benefit in that regard because a couple of those conferences have gone virtual and allowed a little bit more attendance. Um, presumably they may continue in a, in a, in a, um, in a hybrid format going forward. And so, so those are ways to encourage students to, you know, perhaps get a little bit more exposure to, to the kind of work and research that's going on in, in at least one small field. And there are others, of course. And, and sticking in the in the theme of conferences rather than membership organizations, there's the GOMAC Tech, which is the government microcircuits and technology conference that um, has not happened for the past two years because of COVID. But it looks like it um, yeah. right now is scheduled to take place in March in Miami. Mm -hmm. So I'll put the um, website on in the chat for everybody. Over. Great. Just one final question, and um, it's somewhat related to one in the Q and A. And is how much, or how, and this goes back to comments that Ronnie made too. How important are personal relationships with uh, individual faculty, for example, at universities, or um, you know, in, in you know individuals within the university um how important are those for example in uh students coming to to work within the government and uh, security sector um so i'll start off with that i would say that they're absolutely critical um students um you know they value their professor's opinions and if the professors are working on your work um, if they're doing things that are similar to the areas in which you want to recruit students in, um, you know, students are being taught by their professors every day. And so they're, they're listening to the value that they bring. Um, and, and that relationship is very important if you want to not only recruit the students that are there currently, but to create that longevity, right? The, the, the faculty members um, and the folks at the university are there through generations of students. And so if you want to continue that pipeline, you have to be able to build the relationship with the faculty um, and not only faculty, um, the administrators and, and the leadership, the deans as well, you want to continue that pipeline. Anyone else? 
Yeah, well said, Ronnie. I think that that's absolutely true. Of probably more than half of the people I've hired in my career have been because I knew their professor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I see Mark has appeared, so I think we've reached the end of our time. I really want to thank all the panelists for their great perspective on these needs within this within this sector, the defense and security sector. Uh, it's been a great discussion. And I just want to thank uh, Purdue University and Mark for organizing this whole workshop because it's really been a fantastic day and it's been much needed in this sort of renaissance in the uh, semiconductor industry that we're going through. And uh, thank you very much for organizing this. All right, Th and thanks a lot, Steve, for moderating panel three and, and for all the members of panel three. You know, maybe if we have a minute, I could ask a quick question myself here. Um, in, sure. In, in just thinking about how to address this challenge, um, I'm, I'm asking myself, do we need to uh, increase the engineering pipeline and get more engineering students? Or do we need to convince more of the current engineering students to choose careers in national labs and, and defense electronics. Um, my university, like I think most others, we're, we're having surging engineering enrollments now. We're hiring faculty as fast as we can. We're building new classroom buildings as fast as we can. Um, we've heard that there are 21,000 positions open, but uh, some fraction of those are related to national labs and defense contractors in the defense industry. Uh, can we address this challenge for defense electronics uh, simply by uh, making more of our students aware of the opportunities? Uh, you know, a large fraction of our undergraduate students are US citizens. If we can uh, convince more of them to produce, pursue graduate degrees, uh, we'd have more opportunities for people like you, Nathan, to hire US PhDs. So what, what, my question is, where should our focus be? Should it be on increasing the pipeline of engineering students or should it be on working with the pipeline that we have and moving more of them into defense careers? So I'll speak to that because I need engineers yesterday. <laughs> I can't hire enough right now. So I think the urgency of some of the missions that we're facing right now is upon us. And we got caught in a kind of a lull of students coming out with any kind of skills or abilities relevant to our work area. Um, and we cannot find enough engineers and the, and the industry is, dare I say it, incestuous enough that, that, you know, people are jumping from one company to another company, but we're not increasing the pool. We're just leaving a vacancy where somebody left and went to a different company. Um, and so getting, getting students into our hands as soon as possible is for me personally, a, a, a high priority um, because we've got work today that we can't execute that, that if we don't execute soon, we're, we're, we're in danger of falling behind and that's not a good place for a national security lab to be. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll just add one real quick thing. I think that, I think that a lot of people have uh, referred to this as the war for talent. And I think that that is the wrong approach. I think that um, as Nathan said, if you're just stealing somebody from, uh, from a different company and moving them to another, that doesn't really solve the problem at all. You have to increase the pipeline. You have to get into the untapped pools of um, potential students to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. All right, well, th well, thank you all. Th th this really is quite a big challenge in front of us. Uh, you know, engineering enrollments are growing rapidly, but not rapidly enough. So uh, we have a big challenge against uh, ahead of us, but you know we look forward to working with folks like you to address this. Um, I have been asked to, to try to briefly summarize, and uh, we only have a few minutes left, and that's sort of impossible for me to do to summarize the day right now with with some key takeaway points. I'll mention one or two things that stand out to me. Um, and we will try to summarize some of the, the key takeaways that uh, those of us on the organizing committee uh, take away from today's meeting. And uh, we'll try to con get that back to you all and solicit your input on that too. And then think about what the next steps are, because this is a big challenge ahead of us. And we see this as maybe the first in a series of meetings where we can dive deeper into specific uh, actions that we can take. You know, panel one, uh, what I heard from panel one was innovation, innovation, innovation. Company survival is all about innovating. 
and that we're at an inflection point in the microelectronics industry that we need to do more than just bring chip manufacturing back and increase capacity. As Moore's law slow, uh, slows, innovation is more and more important. And we need to increase the pace of innovation. And to do that, we need talented engineers. So the, the, the workforce is absolutely critical to that, as well as new ways of working together to speed the pace of innovation. Uh, new modes of collaborations between universities and companies and companies and companies and, and the industry and the government, shared rapid prototyping facilities, more coordination of efforts and, and things like that. Uh, panel two, a, a lot of the same messages came across. Uh, talent is the semiconductor industry's most important asset. Uh, we heard about the number of 21,000 positions open. Uh, the workforce needs are just very large and they'll grow even larger as we reshore semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, one of the challenges that we in academia deal with is that you know, many students feel that the semiconductor industry is a mature industry it's, and not the one where it's the most exciting one that, that, that they are aware of. Um, but as Todd Yunkin of, of SRC pointed out that as Moore's law is slowing, uh, a seismic shift in the industry is coming. These are really very exciting times. And how do we convey this excitement and all the new opportunities to students uh, to help them consider careers in semiconductor electronics? Uh, Shankar Bansali at uh, NSF pointed out that there hasn't been a new NSF uh, ERC or STC center funded on semiconductors for 10 years. So we really do have to learn how to articulate what makes this field so exciting to us and convey that to the students. Uh, there was also a point made that, uh, you know, given the large needs for the workforce, drawing more women and underrepresented minorities into engineering in general and semiconductors in particular is, is going to be critical to that. And, and Willie pointed out that HBCUs represent only 5% of the universities in the US, but they produce 25% of the nation's black engineers. So, so they're an important resource that can, can help us address this challenge. And then finally here in, in uh, panel three, a lot of the same themes came through. You know, Scott mentioned that, you know, really for decades, there's been a disconnect between manufacturing and the rest of the economy. And uh, so not only semiconductor manufacturing, but manufacturing in general. And we have to address that for the, you know, for the success of the future of our country. Um, lots of, of uh, emphasis that we saw, not only in this panel, but then back in panel one as well, about the importance of the need to develop the technician workforce. Yeah. We heard about the challenges in attracting new hires, you know, how hard it is to compete with companies like Google and Facebook and, and make students aware of the opportunities that are available in the defense sector. So um, lots of challenges, but lots of opportunities uh, ahead of us. Student awareness of the opportunities came across in this panel again and again of, as something that we need to address to make students understand the opportunities that are, that are there. Well, okay, there's a lot to think about and mull over, and uh, that's what I'm going to be doing over the weekend, but th this has been a terrific day-long discussion. I wanna thank all of you who participated on the discussion. As I said, we'll try to get some key takeaways back to you all, and we'll encourage your input on that as well. And uh, I actually, uh, I'm looking forward to subsequent meetings where this is uh, an effort that's gonna require a sustained effort over a sustained period of time by a large group of partners in industry, academia, and the government. And we look forward to taking up this challenge and working on it with you all. So thanks for being with us on this Friday. Uh, enjoy your weekends.